We're going to call our special meeting of the Citizen Advisory Committee for Thursday, May the 18th, 2023, at approximately 3 o'clock. We're going to be have our roll call. Ms. Ritz? Here. Mr. Brown? Here. Ms. Benson? Dr. Walker? Here. Mr. Williams? Here. Mr. Perkins? Here. And Ms. Cromarty? Here. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you. We're going to be led in our invocation and pledge of allegiance by Ms. Cromarty. Please stand. Heavenly Father, thank you for another wonderful day. Thank you for everyone that's rep represented here today. We ask and pray that you give us wisdom and understanding so that we may do your good work. We ask this and many other blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We are on C now. We want the adoption of our agenda. Do I have a motion to adopt, adopt our agenda today? Um, Mr. Chairman? Yes. M may I uh, renew? Uh, I briefly talked about yesterday, but I uh, wanted to renew for formally for today's meeting that the material recycling facility part of the presentation uh, be taken off of today's agenda so it can be added on to Mondays. Okay. We concur. Okay, so that'll be Monday. And it was seconded by Mr. Brown. Are there any other comments? If not, please vote. And it passes by a vote of seven to one. We want to thank all those who were involved. Se oh, not seven to one, seven, seven to zero, excuse me. Yeah, seven, unanimously. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We want to thank all of those involved in uh, getting our system back online from yesterday to today. So we see a difference. Thank you. Uh, open forum. We have no ink slips. So we're going to go into our first presentation of the day. And that would be water reclamation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, CAC members, for having me here today. Um, my name is Randy Sears. I am the director of water reclamation. Um, I am the first one today, so please take it easy on me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we'll jump right in. Um, so who are we? Um, we actually have three different um, primary tasks. Uh, one is the operations of the wastewater facilities. One is the operation of our water quality laboratory. And the other is the operation of our pretreatment program. Now, we're a group of 74. Um, on the wastewater side, we have the Pensacola Beach uh, Water Reclamation Facility. Um, we have a staff of 11 out there, uh, including eight licensed operators. Um, next, Bayou Marcus on the west side of town, kind of hidden out there in the woods. We have a staff of 14 out there, and that we have n um, nine licensed operators out there. The next would be CWRF, um, so 24-7 operations at all three of those locations. If you call at 2 a.m. on Christmas morning, we're going to be there, and we're going to answer the phone. Uh, we have to. Um, CWRF has got a staff of 35, and we have 23 licensed operators out there. Um, now, I mentioned licensed operators, but there is something a little more than that. Um, so we have a grand total of 40 licensed operators. Almost half of those have the top license in the state. So we have 19 A licensed operators at our three locations. Um, from there, 
we go to our water quality laboratory, which is directly across the street from here. Uh, it's a nationally certified laboratory, and we actually have two different sections within the lab. The first is our laboratory analysts. They do our uh, analytical testing. They also do all of the coordination with external laboratories for the entire of ECUA. So any samples that come from water production, any samples that come from any other department, water reclamation, all funnel through our laboratory and whether we, we analyze them there or work with an external laboratory, it goes through this group of people. The other group that's out there is our field services group. This is our field sampling team for ECUA. Uh, it's a group of five. Um, so they are out in the field doing things such as uh, routine sampling events on the water distribution system. If there's a boil water notice, this is the group that's out there to clear a boil water notice or a best management practice if we have a water line break. This is the group that's out there doing sampling for sanitary sewer overflows if we have something on the wastewater side. Something else that this group does is if a customer complaint goes to customer service and it requires an at-home visit, this is the group that'll go to the house as well and visit um, personal homeowners. Lastly is our pretreatment group. Um, this is a group of three. We have two Florida Industrial Pretreatment Association certifications there. Um, this is also home to one of the, um, it, well, it includes the top industrial pretreatment professional in the state of Florida last year. If you remember, we had that award uh, sometime in September uh, for Mr. Jared Tillman. This group is responsible for anything that goes into the sanitary sewer that is not domestic in nature. So, um, for example, that picture right there, that's Reichhold um, Chemicals that is downtown. They actually discharge to our sanitary sewer system and they are required um, to pre-treat their wastewater before it comes to us. Uh, so they deal with all industry in town. They also deal with anything non-domestic. So if there's groundwater dewatering happening, this is the group that deals with that. So looking at targeted accomplishments for FY2023, where are we? What are we doing? Um, number one priority, absolutely 100% is permit compliance on the wastewater facilities. Um, so one of the targeted goals here was 99.9% .9 compliance. Um, where are we? Calendar year 2022, we are gonna get three peak performance awards. Um, if you look there, there was 12,800 and something compliance points and we missed on six last year. Uh, so we were well above the 99.9%. Um, this is, will be the seventh consecutive award for the beach, the 10th for Bayou Marcus. CWRF has gotten seven out of its 11 eligible years. And this will actually be the third time out of the last four years that all three facilities have gotten one. Um, so we're doing pretty, pretty darn well on the compliance side. If, if I can say so myself. Um, the big deal with that is, unlike most operations, you never, you, some, some of you have probably heard me say this before, you never know what's coming down the pipe. A um, Couple examples that we've dealt with so far this fiscal year. Um, we had a septage hauler do an illegal discharge of porta potty cleaner. The blue stuff in the bottom of the porta potties stained everything blue. Um, the entire facility went blue, killed bacteria, do those sorts of things. It's something we got to deal with. On a rain event day that was in October, um, CWRF went from 10,000 gallons a minute to 25,000 gallons a minute in less than an hour. Um, Bayou Marcus on the west side, they have a non-domestic user and their um, wastewater that comes to us is not consistent at all. So we have to be on our game 24-7, making sure that we are ready for whatever comes down the pipe, as I said. The next thing that we've got this year is, oh, well, let me show that one too. So um, this is actually our compliance points for this fiscal year. Um, we're falling a little bit below that 99.9% .9 at Pensacola Beach. The reason is if we go back to December, we had the cold snap. Um, cold doesn't just mess with water pipes, colds mess with wastewater as well. Bacteria do not like cold. They do not want to do their job when it's cold. And at Pensacola Beach, we actually diffuse air into the wastewater. That's how we get air in down there. So we were basically pumping 25 degree air onto bacteria and expecting them to work. Um, just, just, didn't, just didn't work all that well. Um, 
So the next big thing that we had going on this year is our five-year operating permits for Bayou Marcus and, Pensac and, and CWRF are due. Um, the permit application was complete for Bayou Marcus, as you see, on February 6th. On time, just like it should be. And now most people don't understand, don't consider what goes into a permit application. So I brought this for you just to see. This is the permit application for Bayou Marcus. Um, 15 years, it goes back in the past. 10 years in the future, there's tens of thousands of samples and data analysis that goes into it. Um, we have to look. Um, we have to have an outside engineering firm come in and do an operation and maintenance performance report. So that way there's an independent auditor telling DEP we're doing things correctly. Um, so it's a whole lot that goes into that. It's usually three or four months worth of work before we can actually submit it. CWRS is due on June 12th. We are on track to get that accomplished. Um, the plan at this point in time is somewhere right about June 5th to submit, and that way we are actually a little bit early. If we've got a, one last little quirk that comes up, we can bump a day or two and we'll still be okay with our timeliness. Now, I told you our field group um, does sampling for a whole lot of different things. Well, water production has three major sampling events this year that are out of the normal. Um, so the first is the unregulated contaminant monitoring rule. It's done every five years. It's an EPA thing. So far, we have taken 209 samples at 23 water wells. Um, that is what we needed to complete for this fiscal year. There will be another sampling event in the fall. Uh, it's six or seven months after the first one, so we're looking October, November kind of time frame to do the second one, but we'll be on time for that. Uh, the next one there is primary and secondary inorganics. Um, so far, we have pulled 312 samples from 13 water wells, and we'll pull the last 240 this month as well. So we'll have that one done this month. And then I've got lead and copper up there. That one will be in July, so we have that one planned already too. Now, one of the last big things that we've been talking about for a long time is effluent discharge at CWRF. So one of my targeted goals this year was to complete an effluent discharge alternative for the CWRF. Here's where we are. It's actually going to go with the operating permit on June 5th. Uh, so it will be in DEP's hands at that time. What you're looking at there is um, on the bottom left of the screen, those black circles, and then the black circles up towards the top right. Um, those are all going to be percolating wetlands. It's going to be permitted as reuse. It's going to be groundwater recharge. Uh, so it works under all DEP rules. We're looking at requesting a permitted capacity somewhere about 15.8 million. Uh, sorry, my mouth got a little dry here. <laughs> um, when you add that to the current about 7 million that we have under our control, that puts us at 22.5 million, which is plant capacity, which is what we're looking for. For those of you who don't know, we have had past issues with effluent discharge because our two primary users are outside of our control. Florida Power and Light, International Paper, um, they have outages, they have shutdowns, they have mechanical breakdowns, and they stop taking water, and we need a place to go with it. Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, Ms. Benson? Is that now 100% of the, the water that uh, Gulf Power was using in the past for, for running their coolants, or are we still supplying them with some water? We are still supplying them. They're taking between three and four million gallons a day right now. And do you expect that to continue, or what's the projection for that? It's hard to say. Um, they did drop off significantly already when they stopped using coal. Right. Um, there was a, a desulfurization unit that they needed to use when when they were burning coal, and that got shut down when they went to natural gas. Right. Unit six and seven are the two cooling towers that use our water, and there is, from what they tell us, <laughs> there's no plans at this time to be shutting those down. Unit seven has been running down for weeks. Unit six ran almost all winter. Um, so where are they going? We don't know. They're, they're a really hush-hush kind of organization. Yeah. So is what you have planned here adequate for a future, I mean, we, we have capacity awaiting a change in Gulf Power's use. Yes, so this will be 15.7 million. We have the joint wetlands with international paper, 
that's another five million. And then we have Sprayfield 19, which is 1.78 million. Add them all together, that's 22 and a half million. CWRF is doing about 13 right now. Fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. Now, Continue, please. Now, I know that it said we're going to complete the design. So we've put a little bit of a stop on that. The stop is going to be at 30% design. 30% 30% is going to get us to permitting. We don't want to go to 100% design until we know it's going to be permitted. Um, we don't want to spend money on something and all of a sudden DEP comes back and says, no, you can't do that, and we've just wasted a whole bunch of money. So we're going to stop at, stop at 30% until we get to that point. Oh, there we go. So what about next year? Um, next year, we're going to complete the five-year permit application process. So just because we submitted these things to DEP doesn't mean it's over with. They can ask all sorts of questions, request for additional information. Um, there will be several drafts that come out of the permit. Um, there could potentially be public meetings and public hearings about them, all prior to the permit actually being issued. If you look at some of our some of the other neighbors in the, neighbors in the area, it's taken five and six years to get permits, um, depending upon what exactly is happening. So I don't anticipate five or six, six years here, but a year is definitely possible. We're going to finish water production's EPA's EPA requirement for UCMR. We are still going to exceed the 99.9% .9 permit compliance. We will. Um, and then the last thing that I have here that's a, that's a really stick out in my mind is sludge thickening system at Pensacola Beach. So right now, all sludge is tankered from Pensacola Beach all the way to CWRF. And we take about, in the summertime, about 25 loads a week. It's a lot of driving. Um, then when you throw in issues like driver shortages, you throw in issues like the Three Mile Bridge being closed after Hurricane Sally, um, what this is going to do is instead of bringing one one and a half percent solids, we're going to bring about four and a half percent solids. So rather than doing 25 loads a week, we're going to do somewhere about five to seven loads a week. Uh, it's a, it's a it's a lot of res resiliency involved in it. And that way, if we lose a driver, if we lose a truck, if we lose a bridge, we'll be able to work around it. All right. So let's look at the budget for next year. Um, like Jerry yesterday, I'm one of the big ones. Um, so we're looking at 17 million. Uh, it's about 1.75 million more than FY23. Um, if I pull out the salaries, staff, those sorts of things, it drops down to about 1.3 million more than last year. As other... I'm sorry, I need to grab my water real quick. Did you say 1.3 million more? Yes, 1.3 million more if we do not have the salaries involved. Now, as other directors have said, we really don't control salaries on our side. The one thing that we can control, though, is overtime. If you look at my budget this year for overtime, it's only up $1,000. The reason for the $1,000 is because we just opened the pretreatment program as its own division this year. Um, so there's just a little bit of money in there in case they need a little bit of overtime. Now, how have we done that with salaries going up with all the raises that you um, so kindly gave last year? We have made schedule changes at Pensacola Beach, at CWRF, and in the Water Quality Lab to adjust scheduling so we have less overtime. We have more staff when we need it rather than more staff when we don't need it. Um, but that still leaves a whole lot of money. So where is all this money coming from? And it is primarily in four specific items. The first one I pulled out is chemical um, alum. It's an aluminum sulfate. We use that uh, for compliance with our operating permits at all three locations. It precipitates phosphorus. It takes phosphorus out of the effluent. Now, if you look at the bottom there, that's the little chart in the last uh, seven years of cost. It has gone from $219 a ton to $410, with most of that last fiscal year. Um, 
I'm just trying to play catch up here. And we actually got notification just last week that that will go up again this year. Um, they will not hold their cost again for next fiscal year. Um, so that's number one. That's significant. Number two is power. Uh, CWRF's power bill is $200,000 a month. Um, so when you start adding kilowatts and everything, it starts adding up. But something that I pulled out there, uh, we've been doing analysis on kilowatt per hour at CWRF since it started. And something you'll see is a, a regular cycle for a long time. Cheap in the winter, little expensive in the summer, cheap in the winter. FPL came in and look what happened. It just went straight up. Um, somewhere about a penny and a half um, per kilowatt hour. And it stayed there. It did not come back down. It didn't give that normal cycle like we had had. Uh, so power just went, went crazy. Uh, some of you all may be looking at that dip that's right there about December of 2021, I think it is. Um, that's actually an estimated bill from them. That's why it looks kind of funny along, like that. Uh, the next one, um, sodium hypochlorite. Sodium hypochlorite is uh, essentially very strong bleach. Uh, that's what we use for disinfection at two of our three wastewater facilities. Um, you see, going along for a while, we were at 58 cents per gallon. Last year was a dollar, this year is a dollar 16 per gallon, so it's doubling cost. And just like Alum last week, we heard the price will go up again this year. Um, so, so a lot of this money that you're seeing in this budget is me playing catch up. We're going to have to do some, some budget transfers, some operational adjustments kind of thing to make it through this fiscal year. I don't think we'll have a problem. I think we'll make it with and be okay. But we're trying to play catch up and then we got to try to anticipate what that increase is going to be when I bring it to the board during the July meeting because we don't have that number yet. Mr. Williams? Yes, ma'am. May I ask a, a Absolutely, number? please. What is driving the, are, first of all, are these domestic uh, chemicals, are they produced in the United States? And what's driving these in increases, do you know? We've been, we've been hearing about chlorine issues for I don't even know how long. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where the breakdown is. Uh, but there are some utilities in Florida that are complaining that they can't even get it. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's an absolute requirement. We don't have effluent if we don't have chlorine. So, uh, sodium hypochlorite, so we, gotta, we have to get it. Yes, ma'am. Oh, we have another question. Ms. Ritz, you recognize. Thank you. I have two questions. ECUA has, lo ECUA has lobbyists, and my question is, how are they assisting with approaching Florida Power and Light, and is it their role to do that? I guess that's a Mr. Woody question, but I didn't know who could be approached about this issue. Um, and again, the driving cost. Have mining groups stopped mining? Uh, has Canada been looked into for possible sources of minerals? So those, those are the thoughts and questions I have. Okay. We're going to we're gonna allow, allow oh, you, you want to respond, Mr. Woody? Uh, I'll, I'll make a comment about the Florida Power and Light. Okay, and then uh, Florida Power yeah. Light is a um, investor-owned utility, and as such, they're regulated by the Public Service Commission. So that is a board that's appointed by the governor, and uh, every investor-owned utility has to submit a rate case anytime they want to make any adjustments to rates up or down. And they plead that before the Public Service Commission, and the Public Service Commission has a whole staff that evaluates rate case submittals, and um, th they make that judgment. So, uh, really, it's even outside the hands of the of the legislature. There's no direct way for them to even directly influence that. Uh, the board themselves are made up by appointees uh, directly from the governor. Sounds like a political nightmare. Oops, did I say that? <laughs> Which is an example I usually give about the benefits of having a public utility like we have here, where the representatives live in this community, are voted from this community, and can be found once a month at a meeting for your, for your customers. I don't mean to make light of it, but I am concerned. Um, 
Andy Marlette, I think, has quite a bit to say through his political cartoons. But what about the sources for these uh, components that are vital for clean water? Uh, so we need, that would have to go back to prior to production facilities. Things like sodium hypochlorite has got a shelf life. Um, it's like liquid bleach. Um, if you leave it out, if it's been made and you let it sit for several months, it's no longer as strong. Um, so you want to get a, a closest possible vendor, and that way you get it as close to the time it's produced, and therefore you're using less of it, because otherwise you're just wasting it. Mm -hmm. So the stuff we get is 12.5%. If we let it sit in our tanks for three weeks, it's actually going to be 10.5%. So we're going to have to increase our dosage in order to, to maintain our compliance. Um, so as, as close to local as we can get, I think our group right now is coming out of Tampa. Um, and they're making it, and they're getting it to us the next day. OK. Thank you. Mr. Perkins, you still no comment? OK. OK. OK, continue, please. All right, so the last one I've got here is natural gas. We've been hearing natural gas all over the place. Um, you guys have heard it from sanitation and everywhere else on cost of natural gas. The two. Um, Sludge dryers at CWRF run on natural gas. Uh, it's, it's another pricey kind of thing. Um, there's your historical chart on prices of natural gas. And yes, it looks like it's coming down. Um, but there is something that makes me a little hesitant. If you look at that peak from December 21 to March of 22, and then look at the little peak there from December of 22 to March 23, they look awfully familiar to each other. Um, so I'm not going to jump the gun yet and say it's going to drop because it looks exactly like it did a year ago. Um, yeah, I can't say that's going to happen. Maybe it'll fall. Maybe it'll go back to historic levels, but we got to, got to play it just a little bit safe on the safe side rather than being a half a million dollars short on natural gas funds. So when you put all those together, you're over a million dollars. So those four index codes, which is natural gas, electricity, and two chemicals puts you at over 80% of my... 80% of my budget increase for this year. Um, if you want just a couple more, I pulled out a couple more items. Um, and when we add these, you can see that I did show two-year price increases there on the side. Most of them are 50, one of them's 80%, um, something along those lines. Add those to the previous four, and that is 92% of my price increase, just those 10 items. I know it's a lot, but that's, that's the way the markets are right now. So, and that would be what I have for you all today. So you have, a, you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Okay, thank you. Stand by. Uh, Ms. Spencer? So how are you doing for employees? You have vacancies, and are you having turnover problems like everyone else? Or you didn't mention that, so I'm hoping that's good news. <laughs> Uh, out of our 74, we have two current vacancies. Um, one vacancy is actually starting on Monday because he's going to water production. Um, the, the other one was a very short-term employee who um, was doing some over-the-road field calibration kind of work. And you know, anybody who works over the road makes a lot more. He thought that he wanted to stay home, take a pay cut, but he did not adjust his uh, monthly expenses to match that pay cut. So he had to go back on the road. Um, Overall, what, what I typically see in our department is if somebody is with us for two or three years, they're here for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it was to maybe three months ago I had my most openings, and that was four. Um, so I'm not seeing that giant turnover uh, like lots of places. Now, I do have a whole bunch that are coming up for retirement. So it will be happening here in the future. Um, Bayou Marcus, for example, they have the 14 out there. I just had five retire in the last year. Um, it's just that population that's been with us for so long, it's just time for them to enjoy their retirements. But it appears that, if I may continue, they, your employees have unique skills and training that there's not a lot of competition out there in the community for those. It, it depends upon if you're willing to move. Yeah, um, no. So things like Pace Water Systems right across the bridge, they have to have licensed operators. You have Destin, you have Okaloosa, you've got Gulf Breeze. Um, there's not something that's going to be right down the street from you. Right. Uh, but we do have requirements. In order to become licensed, you've got to do the coursework, you've got to pass a test, and you're a minimum of one year before you get a, a minimum license. To get the top license in the state, 
it's a minimum of five years. And we're required to have top licenses for our lead operators at all three locations. But the, but the ones who might be poaching our people are also government entities that have to go through this. Uh, let me ask one other question that's, I don't know if you can answer or not. I, I've been reading a lot lately about natural gas and some of the dangers of natural gas, and they're telling us not to use, to cook with natural gas. Uh, everything's going to induction. I assume that the CNG that we have is perfectly safe and there are no reasons not to to continue using that or the natural gas we use. That's going to be outside of my area of expertise. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Woody? Um, I'm, I'm not aware of any concerns from uh, using it as a combustion fuel in vehicles. Uh -huh. um, what little bit I've uh, also read in the media, like, like you, I think it has more to do with um, trace ex, uh, unburned right. portions of it inside a home environment uh, yeah. as opposed to uh, a vehicle. So uh, I, I think the uh, CNG vehicles are pretty robu robust and, and in good shape. I don't have any concerns there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? I see no more. Mr. Walker, Dr. Walker. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Sears, um, we're having to get, apply for operating permits for the two big plants. Uh -huh. Incidentally, it, once upon a time, we had seven separate plants uh, in this system. Uh, now, for many years, we've only had three. And, and uh, looking at the the employee requirements of small plants versus large plants. I think if we had seven still, we would have far more employees required than what we, the total that we have now. So that's a savings that has, a, a, has a, been accomplished. Well, it was accomplished back in the 90s, I suppose, but it was something worth doing. But um, we have to apply for permits for two plants this year, operating permits. Do we expect any any formal opposition, such as from uh, certain environmental groups or community neighborhood, uh, locally based neighborhood groups or so forth? No. The, so last permit cycle um, for all three of our facilities, the only one that went to a public meeting was actually Bayou Marcus. Um, Friends of Perdido Bay actually just wanted more information. Mm -hmm. We held the public meeting. There was no outcome for it. There was no changes to the operating permit. It was, they, they just wanted to be heard. That's all. Okay. Um, that's, that's good news. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there have been some very acrimonious uh, battles in the past in this county over operating permits for, for us, for uh, the international paper uh, discharge permits and so forth. Uh, and, and it's good that we're beyond that seemingly now. And the second question, Mr. Chairman, yes. uh, and that's my last one, is uh, the, the permitted discharge of the central or reclamation facility is 23.5 million gallons per day? Right, right. now, right now it's, I want to say it's 37 million and change um, because Gulf Power, Florida Power and Light is permitted to take 20 million. Um, so the, the influent flow is going to be the limiting factor at CWRF right now for permitted capacities. It's permitted to take in 22 and a half million gallons a day. 20, 22 and a half. 22 and a half. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, I think it was 22 and a half when that plant first opened. You are correct. Uh, is there any prospect of that, that permit uh, being increased, being enlarged? No. Um, so one part of, as I said, the permit application is to look 10 years, 15 years, 20 years in the future and say, hey, do we need to start looking at expansion? Um, the prediction, I've seen the capacity analysis report for CWRF, it predicted out to the year 2050, and we're only supposed to get somewhere in the area of 17 and a half million on an annual average, which means CWRF would still be okay in the year 2050. We just need the, the effluent discharge. One other comment or question. Is it not true that, that the actual uh, capacity of that plant is much greater than 
the, the physical capacity is much greater than the permitted capacity? It's hard to say. It's really hard to say because we we haven't had to push it that hard, to tell you the honest truth. Um, we've done hydraulically, I know that we can do that. But whether it comes to meeting permit compliance for nutrient removal and disinfection processes, I don't quite know. I don't, I don't want to say yes, I don't want to say no. How many different chemicals do you use? Oh, depends upon the facility. Um, so all three of them use alum. Pensacola Beach and CWRF use sodium hypochlorite. Um, Pensacola Beach also uses methanol as a carbon source. Bayou Marcus uses glycerin as a carbon source. Uh, CWRF uses polymer. And then we use sodium bisulfite at both the beach and um, central to dechlorinate any water that may be going to a waterway. Okay. So it was at six. And the increase is on all your chemicals? Yes. Okay. Okay. I have no more questions. No one on the dice has any more questions. So thank, thank you very much for your presentation. Okay. We are coming up on a second presentation for the evening. And we have anticipated this presentation as much as we did water reclamation. So now, without any delay, we'll have our presentation from engineering. Hey there, good afternoon. Uh, wait for my presentation to load here. Well, I was hoping it would take longer than that, but it did yeah. not. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Stacy Hayden. For those of you that don't know me, I'm the uh, director of engineering here at ECUA. Um, and just to start things off, tell you a little bit about the department. Um, in our department, fully staffed, we're, we have 33 individuals. Uh, currently, we have uh, 27 in the department, so we're, we're down by six. Uh, the department is divided up into four divisions. Uh, one we call our engineering projects division. They handle mainly the uh, sewer expansion projects, uh, antiquated water main replacement, and some other, and some other miscellaneous projects. Uh, excuse me here. Uh, next, we have the Utilities Development Division. Um, they uh, handle the single service, what we call our single service permitting, and the uh, system extension permitting, which we all know is our kind of our developer permits. Um, they deal a lot with uh, the developers, uh, reviewing plans and things like that, and I'll dive into that here in just a bit. And then uh, within that division, we also have our map room, which provides uh, customers with maps and other utilities with their maps and things like that in our GIS division or GIS uh, group, which is part of that division. Uh, they update our maps. They provide uh, other departments with, with maps uh, for specific things like, uh, you know, water production. They'll have system-wide maps to show where our wells are, where, where certain valves are and that kind of thing in the event of an emergency. Uh, next, we have our utility coordination division. Um, it's pretty much as it sounds. Uh, they, uh, this division, they support uh, coordinating with the city, the county, and DOT on their projects, and as well as sharing our projects with them. Uh, next, we have the wastewater infrastructure division. Um, that they are mainly uh, handling the sewer rehabilitation uh, of our collection system. And in addition, their, their main focus is the uh, compliance with the FDEP consent order. The key objectives for the uh, engineering department, and, uh, in addition to in, uh, the permitting, is that we do continually evaluate our water and wastewater system needs and recommend projects uh, to maintain or, or achieve adequate levels of service for our customers. Uh, we do manage uh, quite a bit of the capital improvement projects from, from concept through the completion of construction. Um, also, we ensure that design and construction of the system extensions, developer permits, projects are compatible with ECUA's master plan and in compliance with the uh, engineering manual. Uh, some of the uh, challenges that we have uh, within the engineering department um, for our organization, I should say, uh, and it says contractors, that's not really <laughs> all contractors, it's just uh, relating to some recent issues that we've had with, with some contractors. Um, uh, recently, we've had to uh, issue stop work orders for a couple of our annual service contractors just because they weren't able to perform 
uh, in a timely manner and, and get the work done that we need. And, and in this instance, or these two instances, they relate to our consent order. So we weren't able to, uh, you know, make accommodations uh, for the contractor. We had to cut ties and move on. And you'll be seeing some, some rebidding of a couple of contracts come up here in the very near future for, uh, to rebid that work. Um, in addition, you know, the, um, uh, this, some of what we're hearing from contractors is that, you know, just, just like us, their, their labor costs have gone up, their operating costs have gone up. And so uh, adhering to those annual uh, unit, or price, unit prices in our annual contracts is sometimes pretty hard. And so in the past, we've had some annual contracts that linger on for three, four years to, and then have to go out to rebid. Well, some of these contracts, we may get one year out of a certain contractor, and then they, they throw in the towel and say, look, our, our operating costs have gone up so much so we can't renew that contract, and we have to go out and rebid. Uh, some of the other challenges we have, uh, in, and this goes back to construction costs, um, one project that many of you may be familiar with is the Beach Haven Phase 2 uh, project, and that's a project that we've teamed up with this Gambia County on, and that's a drainage uh, sidewalk and drainage and septic to sewer project with, with uh, the county. Um, that project's been going on for at least three years, uh, well, well longer than that, but I, I think it was bid originally three years ago and uh, then again back in two, 2021 it w had a second bid and the bids came in at roughly fifteen and a half million dollars and got word yesterday that the, uh, <laughs> the they had to rebid the project and that came in at $20 million. So you can see that just over a couple of year period, uh, the, the project has gone up about $5 million. Um, so far, um, I think ECUA's portion of that project is gonna be around the $6 million mark, and we're gonna have to uh, coordinate with the county and see what portion of that $6 million can be funded through grant funds. I know the county is going after grant funds for that. So before um, we bring it back to or bring it to the board for approval, we're going to have to negotiate and see, uh, you know, how much of that, those grant dollars could be applied to this project for ECUA. Um, another, you know, pretty prime example of uh, construction costs going up is the uh, Carpenters Creek uh, Sewer Rehab Phase Three. Um, I don't know if you recall, but uh, this is a project when it was originally bid, we had, um, you know, estimated about one million dollars for construction. I believe when bids came back, it was about 2.5. Um, and so we went back, cut a lot of the scope out, and then rebid the project just to, uh, to get some of the work done because uh, we wanted to make sure to, to rehab that sewer main as, as quick and as best as we could. So it, we basically cut the project in half to get something done this fiscal year. Um, and this is a fun part of the uh, discussion. We, you know, we've all been talking about in, employees and, and you know, losing employees and salaries and things like that. One of the challenges that we've had in the engineering department is that, um, as I stated before, we have fully staffed, we have 33 employees. Currently we have six vacancies. Um, these vacancies range from engineers, engineering technicians, to GIS analysts. Uh, some of the positions we've had open um, requests for, uh, you know, advertising the jobs for, for over a year. Um, in the employees that have left us, some of them very recently uh, left for a 20 to 50 percent or more increase in salary for the same position elsewhere. And um, so in, in some of the organizations they went to, some of them were government agencies. And a lot of times we say, okay, well, they're going for a higher paying job somewhere else, must be in the private entity. No, some of these are, you know, Okaloosa County, um, City of Pensacola that kind of thing. So, um, you know, it's not always consultants, it's not always the private industry that, that we're uh, losing employees to. Excuse um, me. Yes, you sir. said 50%? Yes, sir. Increase? Yes, sir. In other governmental? The, so the, the one that was 50% increase, that was actually going to a consultant from ECUA to a consulting firm. Um, the, um, I know one engineer uh, is leaving. I think that's going to be about a 25 to 30 percent increase. Then they are going to the county, uh, to Okaloosa County, not Escambia County. So. Okay, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Brown. You recognize. With these challenges that you have, you have begun 
dates, projected begin dates, and project, projected end dates for these projects. Are you going to be falling? Is your department going to be falling behind with contracts, construction costs, and the lack of engineers? How are you looking as far as staying on track with what you have scheduled for the next two years? So, sorry, excuse me. So, uh, with doing more with less, that's definitely a challenge. I don't see us falling short. It is going to you know, expand that timeline to a certain degree. Um, you know, our main focus that we, you know, can't fall short on the timeline, I won't say our main focus, but some of the things that we can't fall short on are the consent order. That work has to be done. All those projects have to be completed by 2029. We can't fall short on that. So, um, and the other is we, we just won these uh, uh, grants for uh, the four septic to sewer projects. It was five and we narrowed it down to four. Um, so those have a timeline on them and, and we'll be um, uh, coming to the board on Tuesday uh, for the recommendations of uh, consultant selection for that. So that'll be kicked off. Um, some things, uh, one way that we are trying to um, uh, or may have to adjust is have, have a consultant provide some inspection services to kind of help offset our demand on our inspectors. That's just one of the things we can do. Um, the other is that um, this coming year budget, CIP budget, which you'll, you'll see that on Tuesday, um, that doesn't have a lot in there for engineering other than those septic to sewer and other than those consumer order projects. So we, we still have a lot to do and we still have some projects that kind of uh, have a backlog, but things will have to slow down for us. We're going to do what we can. Um, I don't see any deadlines that we're going to be missing or anything like that. Um, but it is, it is going to be a challenge. Um, I will say that I'm, I'm very thankful that we did have a, uh, a young, young, young lady uh, accept an offer from us, an engineer that uh, will will be starting here very soon. We don't have an official start date for her yet, but she did accept the offer, and uh, that's a little bit of good news in a gray, <laughs> with a gray cloud. Wish you luck on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and this is really more for Mr. Mr. Woody, if, if I might ask. Uh, you know, we, obviously we've got a theme going on, and, and what we're hearing from him, we've been hearing from others about these vacancies. And, and, but the budget requests that I'm seeing, there's nothing about in, uh, increasing salaries or adding personnel or anything like this. At some point, I believe you're the one who needs to, to say, we can't sustain our business based on this, and we're going to have to have some increases. And, and we've done this before. But I would expect that would come from you at some point to say, you know, we're no longer competitive in, in engineering or in some of these other. Is that something that we should expect from you? And if so, at what point? Um, yeah, I had my hand raised to differentiate between because the question was asked and four items were listed while Stacy has um, uh, authority and control over those. Uh, it, uh, the, the fourth problem of salary issues and lo losing staff is a administration issue. Yes, and um, um, Kim Scruggs and I have already been talking about that. You'll remember that we just completed a comp study. Uh, these staff were uh, a portion of that as well and received the same um, uh, overall increases that everybody did last year, but it still just isn't keeping up in their particular um, field. Um, I kind of view their issue much like our CDL issue was a year and a half where we had to address it separately. So we are uh, taking a look at uh, where our industry trends are and what we need to do to, do to catch up. Uh, mechanics are another uh, issue where I'll talk, touch briefly on that when I give the presentation on uh, sanitation as well. We have some ongoing, and that cuts across not only in fleet maintenance, but as Jerry was saying yesterday, in his eye on the uh, staff as well. Yes, thank you. I see no more questions. Please continue. Um, I'll dive into some of our accomplishments, and this is just an overall, you know, some of the high points of our accomplishments. Um, as I noted earlier, we are keeping up with the uh, corrective action plan, the FDEP corrective action plan to reduce sanitary sewer overflows. Um, we're on schedule to still have those projects completed by 2029. Um, one um, 
a thing that we did do back in uh, June of last year, and I know it's falling, you know, here we are, May of, of 2023, but it's an important thing to note, is we were required by the state to do a, uh, to perform a 20-year wastewater needs analysis. And out of that analysis, they wanted you to provide um, information about your sewer rehab program and what it would take, uh, and this is not a full septic to sewer conversion for our complete area, but for a lot of the projects that we already had lined up. Um, that total is, and uh, we need to be clear that that is roughly 450 million in sewer rehabilitation and replacement, and roughly 450 million in the septic to sewer uh, conversion. Um, that is just provides the state with a rough idea, a very very rough idea of what we anticipate. Uh, not everything that we want to do in the next 20 years, but if in an ideal situation, if we had all the money and the budget to do these things and contractors and staff to do it, um, yeah, it would be nice to be able to do those projects. Um, but we don't live in Never Never Land, and um, you know, but it does give us an idea, a target, you know, looking forward. Um, how did you come up with that 20-year projection? So the 20 year projection for the sewer rehabilitation was um, taken from our past uh, um, uh, needs analysis from uh, the consent order. In other words, when we started the consent order, we were required to do an evaluation of our collection system and come up with a list of projects to do um, within a 10 year window. That amount at the time came up to be about $400 million. Um, and then moving forward with the consent order, we said, look, we, there's just no way we can, you know, do $400 million worth of sewer rehab work in 10 years um, for the reasons I just mentioned, staffing, contractors, and, and the, uh, the rates would be um, outrageous. So the sewer rehab portion, that was fairly easy. We, we were able to go back, grab that information, kind of update it with today's costs. Um, and, you know, that's not 100% of our system. That's just looking forward 20 years. Um, and then for the septic to sewer, looking forward 20 years, um, if, again, if we could make, wait, wave a magic wand and have the budget necessary to do those projects, we had a list of septic to sewer projects um, in, uh, kind of in the queue uh, that several over the, uh, the decades that ECOA has been here, um, we had, you know, several projects lined up and we just uh, tried to do a very, very preliminary uh, engineering of, you know, hey, can we put gravity sewer here? Is it going to require a list station? And then apply cost to that to come up with a 20-year 20 uh, year cost. I don't know if that, that does. answers your question. So okay. That does. So is there, I guess, I mean, this is kind of hypothetical, but the, is there, are we going in any kind of logical way with the septic to sewer or were you just looking at areas that you had previously uh, considered? I'm trying to see... I'm trying to project how many years will it take before uh, District 3 will be completed. That's what I'm trying to do right now. Sorry. Understood. Um, may I respond? Or yes, please I, respond. I think Mr. Perkins had a question too. Um, okay. But to, to, to respond to your question at, at first, we have a, a list of projects um, that are measured by, or not measured, but are developed using um, uh, some some metrics from the county. Uh, do you know? Do we have a history, or does the county have a history of septic tank issues, uh, failures, that kind of thing? Is it close to our wells where we, uh, you know, want to get septic tanks out of that system? Um, is it close to the water? Um, you know, that would be another thing to consider. So we have a list of those projects, and then we also have a list of projects that that you know, uh, customers come to the board members and say, hey, we want this area, and, and we focus on those two. Um, altogether, I mean, I mean, it just uh, goes year to year. What does the board want to focus on? Uh, we have, um, you know, we got plenty of projects in the queue, but right now we're focused on those four septic to sewer projects. And uh, we, you know, uh, I, I don't want to be in the board's shoes, but to have that balance of septic to sewer projects that adds to our system versus the list of things that we have to do to take care of our existing system, such as rehab and, and other needs that we have. So, um, yeah, we try to balance that out. But, um, you know, as far as going in a progression, we try to target those areas that we can pr easily provide gravity sewer to without, um, you know, a lift station. 
Uh, some customers, uh, you know, we may get a neighborhood initiated project. We don't have very many of those. Um, and if they come forward, they want to do a MSBU and cost share. You know, we look at that and bring those to the board each time. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Perkins. Well, I was going to just highlight the criteria that Stacy was saying, but there, you know, are some, some other things. Um, you know, eliminating septic tanks is expensive. It's, it's not, it's more expensive than just put it in new sewer because you're going into, you know, roads are already in, everything's in, you've got to tear everything up, get it out, put new stuff in the tanks in and stuff. And so a lot of, a lot of places, you know, take the, take the mindset that, hey, they moved there, they knew it was on septic tanks, why should the rest of the people have to pay for it? That's their problem. You know, DCA has never been like that. Really, Larry Walker was the one that always insisted that we have a septic tank abatement program. He pushed that and, and, and made sure of it. And most years we did it. I think there are a couple of years that we that we didn't actively do septic tank abatement projects. But, you know, for most of the years that I've been here, we did. And we developed those criteria so that it wasn't just, you know, political buddy-buddy stuff. It was sound criteria. If it's near a water well, well, you don't want septic tanks linking into a water well, well have protection area. So we want to do that. If there's a threat to public health and safety, if the kids are running around and playing in leech leachate from septic tanks, you want that fixed. You don't want kids running around playing in sewage, you know. So a threat to public health and safety. If it's contaminated in area surface waters, you know, if it's if the septic tanks are flowing all into the bayou or the bay and, and polluting it and ha causing fish kills and everything like that, you want to you wanna have that. If the county is put in, in a big drainage project and there's a, a chance to save some money, you, we want to we wanna be able to do that. Um, if we get matching funding, like the, the legislature did the Brownsville thing recently, so if we get a situation where we've got matching funding or chances for appropriations where we can make the dollar go further than, than other places, we could do that, and then, like Stacy said, you know, the neighborhood initiated. It, it's rarely done, but occasionally a neighborhood will get together and say, "Hey, we're willing to pay a portion of this project if we can move it up, you know, and, and, and get it going." And so we look at those. So there's a number of criteria, mm -hmm. but that's the smaller part of the problem. The bigger part of the problem is the enormous cost. And if we if we put too much money into redoing septic and put in sewers in areas and neighborhoods that have already been built and they just have septic tanks um, then we start taking away from being able to expand and build new sewer systems or maintain the systems that we have so it's kind of it's kind of a balancing act it's it's important and it's something we've got to do but we also have to realize that we're limited by lack of capital sometimes on it mm -hmm. yeah. okay I see any more questions yeah. Thanks, sir. Um, moving on with the accomplishments, I've already mentioned the $11 million in grant funds from DEP for the four septic to sewer projects. Um, I also noted earlier we have the consultant selection coming up um, for the continuing um, consultant services and the septic to sewer grants uh, grant projects coming up on Tuesday. Um, and then um, lastly on this slide, uh, we, we have coordinated with the city and I spoke to our utility coordination stuff the other um, few slides back, but we have coordinated with the city and county and DOT on multiple projects. Uh, some good examples of that is the Lee Street, uh, Lee Street um, that's a drainage and sidewalks project that we were able to jump in and, and do uh, sewer expansion. Um, that project is a very important project to us because that project has allowed us to put in a backbone for future sewer expansion. I think that uh, the backbone is a 15, a larger diameter pipe normally used uh, uh, compared to sewer, um, that we can branch off with the smaller pipes and get uh, connect uh, for septic to sewer there. Uh, Beach Haven, um, again, uh, septic to sewer, that's phase two, that's coming up, and we'll have to bring that to the board. Pretty okay, redundant force main, um, you know, that project is, uh, I don't know if you've uh, the um, uh, the the guards around the bridge on the intercoastal waterway uh, I forget what to, to call them but uh, there are little guards around the, uh, the pilings for the bridge and they are re being redone because a barge hit that uh, I think during one of the hurricanes 
and um, we found that it's a, it's a good opportunity for us to go ahead and put in a redundant force main in case uh, something happens to the one that's that's in there now while they're under construction. Um, we didn't we weren't able to put it in there before they were under construction, um, but uh, we're we're pretty confident about where that is, and and we're putting we're moving forward with that project just because we see the importance of it. Because if something did happen, that's the only lifeline to the beach for sewer service, uh, for Perdido Key for sewer service. Um, several relocations on Scenic Highway, Nine Mile, uh, I-10 crossings, Lillian Highway, and Sorrento Road. Um, a lot of those are, are valve box adjustments. Uh, you see for the water valves and manhole adjustments and that kind of thing for when they're resurfacing. But a lot of those are also uh, relocation of uh, water lines and sewer lines. Um, moving on to the next slide, uh, this uh, the next few Photos here are just uh, images of some damaged sewer mains. Uh, we can talk about sewer rehab all the time. Um, a lot of this, a lot of times, sewer can be damaged by um, you know cross bores. Uh, cross bores when another utility drills in, for instance, a gas line, a, a communications cable, or something like that, and they would uh, hit our our sewer mains. Uh, this is a prime example. You can see the uh, um, the pipe. In the hole up there, I don't want to say what kind of pipe that is, take a guess, but uh, that's just an example of a, a service hitting that. Um, this next photo, um, you can see kind of at the top middle part of the screen there, you see soil. Um, this is looking down the uh, sewer main with a lateral connection, and you see the soil visible. And this is just a prime example of what happens under the roadway and what can create uh, potholes in the roadway. And, and just over time, it can uh, let the sand enter in the sewer main, undermine the roadway, and create a major issue. So we got to, um, this is just kind of one example of, yes, we want to do uh, sewer rehab to lock up the system, uh, make it watertight. But at the same time, uh, this is a roadway issue, too. Uh, that can be much more costly if we don't rehab. And so this repair, you know, um, this is Booth Avenue, but if there, there could be a repair under Scenic Highway or, or uh, Davis Highway, and some of those repairs can be $50,000 when we're looking at a roadway repair and milling and overlaying. So, um, and if we can rehab it, you know, to rehab the main line to, or to rehab this lateral, that may be $6,000 if we were to do it trenchlessly. Um, just another beautiful photo of a damaged lateral. Um, kind of fond of these photos, but uh, this one shows up what I think is a communications cable or a gas line, actually. Uh, going down a sewer service lateral that um, had to be, I mean, this this lateral just had to be dug up and replaced altogether. Um, so part of our accomplishments, uh, you know, moving to the um, uh, system extension or the permitting side of things, um, you can see from uh, 2013 to 2022, uh, these are the number of system extension applications that we have received. Um, Last year, I believe the number was 107, 111, and uh, this year, or for 2022, it went down just a little bit, I think, to about 104. So it's just about, a, a, I think it came to about a 4% decrease between 2021 and 2022. Um, this year in 2023, I think at the time this was taken, we had about 28 um, system extensions submitted, and you know, if I, I look at that and we project that, we're going to be over 100 again for this year. One of the reasons why that is very important to it. Uh oh. There we go. Okay. One of the reasons why that's important to us, and, and to kind of go over a little bit more numbers here, a little over some other numbers here, uh, we have 272 uh, system extensions that have been currently approved or have been approved and our pending completion of construction. That doesn't mean that they are under construction, that just means that those are uh, approved permits that can go and build, you know, it could be anywhere from a, a large development to a, uh, like a, um, I don't know, like a Chick-fil-A with a grinder pump. Um, in 2021, we closed out 34 of those, uh, those permits, or finally accepted 34 of those permits. 2022, we had 44, and uh, for 2023, so far this year, we've had 19. So it looks like, you know, if we double that, we're close to 40. So on par for what we've done the last couple of years. In addition, we've got approximately 20 uh, capital improvement projects that are currently under construction. 
And the reason I'm mentioning all this, I'm leading up to, is the title is Light Inspections or our Utility Construction Inspectors. There, there are days that uh, our, our inspector has to spend uh, a full day at a construction site, be it a developer project or an ECUA, you know, a capital improvement project. But if I take all the projects we have and the time, the number of inspectors we have available, and apply that over all the projects, we're only looking on average about 30 minutes that an inspector has available to be at a construction site. So this is a fairly new metric that I'm going to look at here because, you know, bottom line, um, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're playing roulette with some contractors. Some contractors are great. I should say poker. You know, some contractors are great. You know, we can we can trust, but you need to trust but verify. That's what our inspectors are there for. Um, but if I play poker with some friends here, I can trust them pretty good. Uh, so I have some good contractors, and then I got some contractors from out of town. I don't know them, so I can't really trust them behind my back. And in those, you know, we're we're playing roulette, we're playing poker, we're gambling essentially on. Is the contractor doing a good job or not while we're not there and able to witness it? Now, we, we try, we do hydrostatic testing, uh, you know, to pressurize the pipe, test it, make sure it holds pressure. We do bacteriological testing to make sure it's, there's no bacteria in the water main prior to placing it in service. Um, we make sure it's at the right depth. There aren't any conflicts. Um, vacuum testing. We do a number of different tests, and that does help us, but, you know, um, Again, that 30 minutes per construction site, we don't get everything, we don't see everything we'd like to, and at least leaves room for uh, some, some folks to take advantage of us if they wanted to. Um, looking forward, and I'll, I'll get through these here a little more quickly here, but um, we, we're going to continue to update our water and sewer models. Um, you know, that helps us in evaluating you know, what our needs are as development increases for our water and sewer system. And occasionally we model new development um, due to the complexity of the collection systems and, and proliferation of the, uh, the low pressure systems. That's going to be, become more and more of an issue. Um, low pressure systems, it's private grinder pumps. Um, you know, we can't have them discharge into every force main uh, or every pressure system. It has to be low. Uh, you know, if it were our choice, we would like to have everything gravity and not have to do a low pressure system. Um, the other uh, uh, looking forward is uh, better leverage the benefits of our GIS. Um, I think there's a lot that we could take advantage of with our GIS system, and, and we're looking at ways to do so. Um, but currently, we uh, you know plot water main breaks, uh, plot force main breaks, sanitary sewer overflows, and with that, we can use that as a tool to say, okay, does this pipe need to be replaced now? Is there a hot spot? You know, have we had multiple sanitary sewer overflows, so we know to go back and. Uh, you know, increase the, the maintenance interval uh, for cleaning that pipe to reduce the, the chances of it overflowing. Um, and then the other part of this is, um, you know, moving forward, we really need to look at asset management. Um, and that is, uh, you know, <laughs> that is a pretty broad term, but if we're, we're going to be looking for grants and things like that, then we really need to be looking at our, our asset management program because that's what they're going to be, at, one of the questions they're going to be asking. And if we don't have an asset management program, um, then that does put us at a disadvantage when they're looking at grants. Um, the other thing, we have uh, environmental regula regulations that we're contending with right now. Um, some of you may have heard uh, the lead and copper rule. Um, you know, basically that puts a, uh, uh, puts together a database to say what is in our system and there's public notification requirements, water sampling requirements, and that is a, a nationwide program that we have to do, that we have to, uh, uh, be in compliance with. Um, the next topic is, uh, PFAS, uh, polyfluoroalkyls. Am I saying that right, Don? <laughs> okay, yeah, so uh, that, that long word there. Um, so that's another issue. That's more for uh, water production to address with uh, their, their systems, and I'm sure Tom will speak to that later. Um, in addition, uh, Senate Bill 64, um, you know, that's basically a, um, um, a state um, bill to uh, minimize the discharge to, um, uh, to, to surface waters. Uh, they, it's a water conservation measure. 
that may impact us. And as Mr. Sears uh, stated earlier, that's that's one of the th one of the reasons why we are trying to do what we're doing with the uh, the wetlands or the uh, perp ponds. Is that a fair assessment? Um, moving forward. Um, Next, uh, yeah, continue to update the models. I can't harp on that enough. Um, that is a big tool for us because you know we don't have real world um, information about something that's not built yet. So uh, the hydraulic model is the best tool that we have available sometimes to do those things. It's not always 100% accurate, but it's the best thing that we have right now. Um, and the other thing is to perform more in-house design with antiquated water main projects, uh, transite water main replacement projects, minor sewer expansion whenever there's a uh, a utility coordination project, um, you know, that's a good opportunity. Can we put sewer in while the uh, DOT or the county or the city is uh, putting in some drainage? And some, a lot of times that's a good opportunity for us to jump in and, and participate. Okay. Oh, sir, um, lastly, um, I'm going to, uh, I've got our, our budget broken down into three different account descriptions. We got personal services, which is our salaries and benefits. Um, that is uh, proposed to go up about 7.2%. Our support services, which is basically per diem professional services, such as surveying, some other consulting work that we would do, smaller consulting work that we would do um, outsourced to per diem, that kind of thing. There's no change there. And the last item there is uh, materials and supplies, office supplies, software, tools, fuel. And that is actually going to be increased by about $14,000, uh, which is a 17% increase in our proposed budget um, for this coming fiscal year. Um, I will say that we didn't have a, uh, and you may see that on your, your handout for the department, that we did not have a uh, increase in that line item last year. And so we are you know, making, forward, uh, making up for it this year and making sure we have adequate budget for that this coming fiscal year. With that, at this time, I'll take any questions you may have. Okay, great. Ms. Benson? Yeah, I have a question. Oh. Yep. Ms. Benson, you're recognized. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I don't know if you're the one to ask this, but do you keep a record of where new meters are being put in, where growth is? And is, is there, if I came to your office, could I have a snapshot of of the growth in Escambia County? We, um, it would be fairly easy to, I'm, I'm sorry, it would be fairly easy to put together. Um, I have a GIS map that isn't printed, but I could print it that it has all of our developments from a certain time frame, and I can adjust that time frame uh, that, that have um, applied for a permit, you know, in various stages of the permitting process. So yes, I, I could do that, but as far as a spreadsheet, I don't have a table saying, hey, um, you know, 300 homes are going over here, but um, I could have something like that put together fairly easily though. It just, I, you know, I think something like that would be very valuable to have and, and of use to all kinds of different departments and people outside of us. And I just didn't know who would be responsible for, for having that kind of information readily available, but I assume that would be you. I mean, obviously we're seeing all of these costs going up and the need for personnel, but we're growing too. So we're going to have some income coming in and, and, and that means also more projections for maintenance and all of that. And um, just that demographic data would be uh, interesting to, to keep, so. I would like to add that uh, our regional service department, they do take GPS points of, of new meters as they go in. So that would be new meters as they go in, but from just a broad stroke, um, you know, where are projects being, um, where are developers going? We, we do have that on, on map. That's a good visual, too. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brown, is that for? Yeah, that's a, that's a Okay. And along with Ms. Ritz, that's previous as well. Okay, that's previous. So would you like to speak, Ms. Ritz? You recognize, Mr. Hayden. How many asset management personnel are needed? And my second question is, how many inspectors are needed so that they can spend more than thirty minutes? Because that's a very limited time to spend on a job site. Yes, ma'am. That's um, that is a 
a beginning metric. Uh, I say beginning, um, we haven't looked into that before, but I just know that my inspectors are being pulled in thousands of different directions. <laughs> but um, with that, we're gonna have to make up um, if we can't hire additional inspectors and, and I'll have to find out what that happy medium is um, that I don't have yet. Um, but in the meantime, we would have to rely possibly on some consultants to do some inspecting for us as part of the CIP projects. Are they more economical since I guess you're not having to pay uh, for their retirement and health insurance? Um, Is it more economical to use? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. It's uh, to use a uh, private consultant similar to as for engineering services, for inspection services, we, we would have to pay quite a bit more, oh, more? for that service. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. That was it. Thank you. Okay, um, I see no more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Water production. Good afternoon. Afternoon. Uh, my name is Tom Dawson. I'm the director of water production, and we have a presentation um, to go through. Feel free to. Stop me at any time if you have any questions. Uh, a little bit of background about our department. Uh, we have 22 licensed water operators, anywhere from a C to license to an A, with A being the higher uh, license. We have a well mechanical maintenance division that has seven people. We have the communication center, which you probably know as SCADA. Uh, has got 12 people, and then Cross Connection Control has five people. Uh, license and certifications, we have two licensed professional engineers, uh, 22 employed for water treatment plant operator license, and the reason it's 22 instead of 20 is we actually have two mechanics that also have water operator license, but they're not in the water operator position, they just have that as uh, part of their training. Uh, we have one licensed master plumber. We have five certified backflow prevention assembly testers, three of which have certifications for backflow prevention assembly repair and cross connection control survey and inspection. Uh, 15 of our employees have CDLs, four of which have tanker and hazmat endorsements. And we have three employees with water distribution system operator license. So probably 70 to 80 percent of our staff, if not more, has got some sort of license uh, or certification that's required for them to do their job. Okay. Uh, activities and responsibilities, we have 31 permitted wells. Um, at this time, 28 of those are in service. Uh, all of those wells, with the exception of one, have their own treatment facility. Uh, we have Avondale, which is the only one that doesn't have its own. It actually pumps to Muldoon, where water from both of those wells are treated in the same water treatment facility. Uh, we have eight ground storage tanks with five major pump stations. We have six elevator water storage tanks and three booster pumps. Um, and obviously these pictures are the three or four tanks on the beach. Uh, and then the tank that we refurbished a couple years ago on I-110, which is East Tank. Um, we mentioned SCADA. Uh, SCADA is manned, operated, better way to put it. Uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, holidays, it doesn't matter. We always have somebody in SCADA during uh, times like hurricanes or heavy rain events and things like that. We have uh, sometimes three or four in there, depending on the, the volume of calls we expect and that sort of thing. But that is really the, uh, the backbone of our, um, especially the water system. There's a water side and a lift station side. The water side, if you're looking at uh, Johnny, that's Johnny Alford, um, 
The screen behind him shows all the facilities, whether it's a tank, a pump station, or a well. Uh, we can operate, turn them on and off, and do other things directly from the, the SCADA room uh, across the street. Uh, Cross-connection control, um, besides working with commercial and residential uh, properties to make sure they have the backflow prevention assemblies that are required by uh, FDEP rule. We also test our own facilities, whether that be buildings. This happens to be, I believe, outside the lab. And then uh, at the lift stations, and uh, we also test the backflows that are there. Uh, goals. Um, our goal is pretty much the same every year, so I'll go through it pretty fast. We want to provide as high quality water with quantities sufficient for demand, including fire flow. Um, we deal with a lot of agencies. We deal with a lot of people. We want to do that in a professional manner. Um, and I think that the folks that we have do a very good job of doing that. Uh, objectives, um, and I'll go through some targeted accomplishments uh, pretty quickly. Probably the most important thing there is the second bullet, uh, and that's meet and surpass all primary and secondary water quality standards. I think Randy talked a little bit about the water sampling that has to be done. There are thousands and thousands of water samples that have to be done. There are hundreds of reports. Um, it's, uh, it's something that we have one person dedicated to following all the requirements we have for compliance, and that's our compliance coordinator. She's done an, an excellent job. Um, did this a little different this year than I did last year. Last year I went through the 23 uh, targeted accomplishments and indicated where they were, and then later we went through the 20 the next year. Um, this year I'm putting them both on the same slide. So for granular activated carbon treatment, uh, the proposed accomplishments from last year, uh, Ellison Well, we have uh, completed construction of the GAC treatment system, which included four vessels in the piping and all, and it is in service. Uh, and we are currently working on the Avondale Well and the Muldoon Well uh, we've got the vessels, we've got them on their concrete foundations, and we are working on the piping uh, for that system. And we hope to have that in service hopefully in the next four or five months or so. Um, we also purchased, and I think everyone knows about PFAS and uh, the newly proposed MCL and what that is going to require of us. Um, in order to try to get ahead of that sum, we have ordered 16 additional GAC filter vessels for three well sites. Um, the lead time for those right now is anywhere from six months to nine months. Um, so we're trying to get those on the way so that we can uh, have those when we need them to do the, you know, to place them at the well site and do the piping and all. Let me see. So how many will will that be for us to have the GAC filters, PFAS filters on? How many more wells will we need those filters on? Uh, of the 28 active wells we have, um, two of them don't have detectable PFAS levels, and we have, I believe it's five others with PFAS levels below the proposed MCL. We have one more, I think, that's real close. It's not over it now, but it's right, you know, at the four parts per tree and for PFOS and PFOA. Okay. So total, you know, of our 28, all but, what, six or seven are going to have to have GAC. How many? Okay, so that's like 22. 22 or so. Yeah, and, and we we're have, have right. And how many of those twenty-two have uh, have we allotted funding for the PFAS 
cartridges, JC filter. Uh, at this time, looking at the new regs, we had 16 wells that did not have treatment in yet. Uh, nine miles, one of the biggest. Uh, we've ordered uh, eight of those 16 vessels are for nine mile. Um, we have uh, work going on, like we said, Avondale and Muldoon. Uh, we're wanting to put vessels on Royce in fiscal year 24. And then over the next couple years, yeah, we're going to have to accelerate the, uh, you know, the, the schedules for getting the other wells uh, with the treatment. Now, one thing we don't know is the MCL has been proposed. We don't know exactly how long it's going to be before it's enforced. Um, and I say that because at this point, there's lawsuits and challenges to the proposed MCL. We don't know how those are going to go. But it looks like uh, at the minimum, we'll have four years. Uh, it looks like they'll have a year to enact uh, the, the new regulations, unless that's challenged and it gets bumped back. And then normally, once they set a new MCL for a compound or compounds, you have three years to comply. And with our recent uh, water report that you just published, Mm -hmm. uh, which we, our drinking water is satisfactory or better. How, how will not having those filters affect our water quality? Well, once we get to the point that the MCL is uh, in force and being enforced, they have to be, or we can't use them. Or we can't use those wells. Right. If the MCL or well is over four parts per trillion, you have to put in treatment or discontinue use of that well. Okay, okay. And so we could operate with less, less wells and still have high quality water. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, great, great, thank you. A, a part per trillion, just for you know, comprehending that, is one person out of the entire <laughs> world's population. So they have to really, really, you know, work hard to to uh, not only measure that, but to you know get it get it out of anything. Yeah, it is a it's a great way of putting that. One of the things I wanted to compliment the board on particularly is is uh, Mr. Perkins, Dr. Walker, and Ms. Benson, and all the years of experience and how they help uh, others see things. The way they've seen it, I've been explaining to them several times before. So, just in just in, in passing, that's a that's a compliment. Thank you. Please continue. If no more other questions, yeah. Um, we have two optimization projects ongoing right now. Um, one is the granular activated carbon optimization. We just talked about how many of our wells are going to have GAC filters. We've been working with a consultant and doing a lot of testing to see if there are more economic ways to either arrange the GAC filters, whether, you know, right now, ours are in parallel. So water goes through each filter and on into the system. We've looked at going in series where it will go through the first and then go through a second one. And then you would, you know, once your uh, carbon uptake ability on the first is used, you start seeing it in the second vessel. Uh, and it, but that allows you to run the, the concentration up in that first vessel without fear of having it break through, because you have a second vessel. Um, we've looked at that. For VOCs, that looks very promising. Unfortunately, for PFAS, it doesn't. Uh, but we're looking at a lot of other things, whether that be additives or, you know, the different treatment techniques. Uh, it's, it's something that is changing daily. Because anybody that can find, you know, a better way to treat it more economically, you can imagine, yeah, <laughs> yeah the financial portion of that. So but. series or parallel, which one works best for... <laughs> Or does it work well for PFAS? Which one? You said it does not. 
The parallel is having just, sing, it goes through single vessels. Right. It doesn't go through a vessel and then go through another one. In series, it goes through a first vessel and then goes through another vessel before it goes out into the system. For VOCs, it looks very promising, and we have several that have VOCs. Unfortunately, for PFAS, because of the way PFAS is, um, it showed that it really wasn't that big of an advantage, but we are looking at some other other things. And we also have three wells with iron treatment, so we have to look at the iron treatment doesn't really work that great for the PFAS treatment. The PFAS treatment doesn't work real well for the iron treatment, so you're going to have to have at least an in-series type of treatment where you go through one to treat out the PFAS and then the second one to treat out the iron. Okay, okay. But okay. that's the kind of stuff we're looking at. Okay. And um, the Arcadis is the consultant and the gentleman who is um, the main contact and lead for them actually has written several books on GAC treatment that have been published by the American Oil Workers Association. So he's one of the experts in probably nationally, if not worldwide. Okay. The second optimization we're doing, we are actually doing uh, through a partnership with the U.S. Corps of Engineers. It's called Planning Assistance to States. Um, and what we're doing there is we are looking at ultimately having a computer that will real time tell us where the demand is and what the best way to meet that demand is. You know, how many wells do you need on? Which wells are the, you know, the best ones to have the most economic uh, for any given circumstance while also getting some runtime on the wells that they have to have. If you look at the graph on the bottom, the bottom gray in blue is the cost for each well to treat and produce a thousand gallons of water. So you can see on the left side, those are more economical than ones on the right side. And then the red line that comes down is how much we utilize each of those wells historically. So as you can see, there's probably a couple of wells we should be using more, and there's some we probably should be using less. And so hopefully when we get through with this whole program with the Corps of Engineers, we will have a model sitting there telling us this is your best way to meet this demand most economically. Okay. Uh, well column rehabilitation. Uh, this is actually a picture of a pump coming out of a well. Um, we try to pull these wells every 15 years or so uh, so that we can inspect the pump, inspect the pump discharge piping, inspect the screen, clean the screen and the casing and all of that. Okay. Um, I want you to pause right yes, there. Sir. We have a question. Okay. Ms. Rich? I had a question. When Baptist Hospital opens its new facility, how will it impact uh, the water pumping wells. When who opens the new? Baptist when Hospital. Baptist Hospital uh, opens its new facility and ceases. Uh, we, we're actually actively looking at that right now. Um, we're working with a consultant. Davis is one well that's been out of service for quite a while. Uh, Davis is one well that would uh, help the Baptist Hospital demand in the situation where our PCC tank had to be taken out of service and they had a fire while it was out of service. Unfortunately, Davis has got issues not only with PFAS, but it also has issues with iron and manganese. And manganese is a hard substance to remove. You cannot remove it with GAC, so you have to go with a multimedia type filter. So you can't treat the manganese the same way you treat the PFAS, so you're going to have to have several treatment technologies at Davis to put it back in service, and the estimated cost is in, it's like $12 million. To put that one well back in service? Well, that includes building a new water treatment facility and, and a few other things. Okay. But you're looking at the water treatment facility is $3 million. The uh, GAC treatment you know, you're looking at at least $2 million for that. 
uh, green sand or some other multimedia, it's another two, two and a half million. Uh, it just, you know. So we're also starting to look at some other alternatives to that, like putting in some more transmission main, some stuff like that. Okay. Did you have comments, Mr. Woody? Yeah, I just, in, in, Tom gave you a whole bunch of information around, about uh, the surrounding system outside the immediate uh, area and things that we're looking at as well. I think the short answer to the original question, though, can we meet their demand, the answer is yes. Yes, we can. Yes, I don't want that to be mm -hmm. misunderstood. Mm -hmm. Right. The rest of that was a Pensacola Christian College tank has to be maintained. So you have to take the water out of it and you have to maintain it. We'd like to have more redundancy, uh, and that's why we're looking at Davis and some other options. Thank you. Okay. Um, one of the wells we pulled this last year was Nine Mile. We did full rehab on that well column when we pulled the pump and inspected it. One of the uh, it had a crack in one of the uh, propellers. Uh, I'll say propeller, that's probably the best way to put it. Um, University well, unfortunately, started pumping sand. So we had to pull the university well, and we're trying to figure out what we can do with that well. And it, it looks like we are going to be able to put it back in service. We may have to alter the uh, the pumping rate, lower it some, and we may have to alter where the pump intake is within that screen. Uh, but we're looking at that right now. Um, Lillian Well is a, a well that we had pulled discharge piping and all on, and the specific capacity, which really is how much water you can pump from the well itself based on the aquifer and your screen and all, that specific capacity has dropped by half. It used to pump 2,000 gallons a minute, now it's pumping 1,000. So we hired a uh, well consultant to go in and do several cleaning methods, including some pretty rigorous cleaning methods to try to see if we could clean up the gravel pack and maybe go out in the formation and get some, some, uh, some debris or sand and that kind of stuff out of it. And unfortunately, we were not able to recover that specific capacity. So we're going to be putting that well back in service with a different pump, different size discharge casing that's more economical uh, and more efficient to run at 1,000 gallons a minute. Okay. This coming year, we want to pull Royce and Kingsville wells. Um, we'll start that probably in November when we can have the wells out of service. And um, hopefully we don't find any surprises on that. Uh, lime room rehabilitation, uh, one of our scheduled accomplishments was to have the Watson Well and Muldoon Well lime rooms uh, refurbished. Um, we put them out for bids in a joint bid package, and the bids came in at $676,000 to repair two lime rooms. Uh, when we first started doing the major rehab on these, it was under a million dollars. And then it was 1.2, but that change happened over years. Just it has accelerated now from one and a half million to, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, 300,000 to uh, 676,000 for two. And not to confuse you, I had numbers from another project in my head. And, uh, but the lime rooms are, it's getting so expensive to do them, we actually uh, rejected the bids for those two wells. Because of the cost? Because of the cost. So, Mr. Chairman, may I ask? Yes, I, 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 Just from a process point of view, I find this interesting because we, we went to this system of uh, targeted, uh, you know, goals and accomplishments. 
And, and so I like what you're doing because you're really going back and you're showing what you did do and what you didn't right. do. And I think that's as valuable. So in, in a case like this, obviously it was on your list because it needed to be done. Mm -hmm. Does it bump up to the next year where costs are going to be greater? You just have to budget for it better. But I, but I think it's an interesting exercise to have to do that and see where we fall short. And, and I don't think falling short is always a bad thing. I mean, we just have to analyze and, you know, readjust our goals. Right. One thing I wanted to mention, and it's actually on another slide, but I think it's appropriate to mention it now. The other numbers I listed, which was below a million dollars and then 1.2 to 1.5 and 3 is replacing the whole water treatment facility. Uh, and that's where I got ahead of myself. We, we actually bid Cantonment out this year and the bid was so high we also rejected it. The flip side of that are, you know, instead of replacing the whole building, you go in and you work on the roofs or you rehabilitate the lime rooms. Um, you know, either way, the cost has doubled in the last couple of years. Has doubled? Doubled. This is construction costs or rehabilitation costs, not chemicals, but actual. That's not even, that's not getting into the chemicals. Okay. Like I said, we, uh, normally the water treatment facility uh, replacement was around a million to 1.5 million over the last eight or 10 years or more. And when we bid Cantonment this last time, it was 3 million. Okay. And then when we did the lime rooms, like I said, that cost has also doubled. And what we're gonna do on both of those is go back and look and see, is there any cost savings we can do? Any uh, material changes? Uh, design of the building, design of the room, et cetera, that we can do and save costs without compromising the facility. I don't know that there is. We may find out that, you know, the next time we bid it out, it's still gonna be three million for the whole building. It may still be, you know, 325,000 plus or minus just to upgrade the lime room. Please continue. Um, <clears throat> Interity pump station rehabilitation. Uh, this pump station is out uh, towards Interity Point, Interity Island. Uh, it's an older facility and we're looking at upgrading it. Uh, new electrical, new pumps. Uh, the current pumps are not capable of running off a of VFD and we really need to have pumps that are capable of running off a of VFD so that we can manage the pressure out on Interity Point Road and Interity Island better than what we're able to do it now. Right now the pumps are on or off, so you either more or less over pressurize almost when they're on to not have enough pressure when they're off. So that should take care of that problem. Uh, this is the one I kind of jumped ahead on before. Uh, we've already talked about it. The Cantonment project came in at right at three million. We're also going to bid out Royce. Uh, which one was it? Uh, we were going to bid out another facility, and I think it was. Uh, I want to say Royce, but I don't think it was Royce because of the fact that. Cantonment came in so high, we decided not to bid it at this time. Uh, master plan hydraulic modeling, I think Stacy talked a little bit about that. Um, our biggest challenge uh, in the past few years has been the Beulah area. Um, we've done modeling to see what the best way is to get additional water into that area. Um, we've looked at, in the past, two wells were drilled actually in Beulah. Neither one worked out because of turbidity. We have found a piece of property on the, the end of Divine Farms Road, um, and we are looking at 
the possibility of a well there. We're also looking at the possibility of some transmission main to bring water into the, uh, the Beulah area. And we model that, um, you know, to see what size mains we need, what capacity well we need, that sort of thing. And we do a little bit of what was asked. We, we work with Stacy and them, and you asked about uh, future projects and that sort of thing. We actually did get with engineering and we got a list of projects that have been approved uh, that are either, you know, about to be built out, uh, just starting to get homes in them or, or planned, and those were all put in the, the model to predict what we needed to meet those. And then, you know, also in the, uh, the future, there's going to be more projects. So you look at the trend and you uh, look at the future demands based on, you know, what, you, what you're seeing right now and what you've seen in the past. So um, let me go to this one, talking about the Beulah Well. This is the piece of property that we have purchase from IP. That is a drill rig and they're actually doing a sonic drill for a test hole. And we went in and did the test hole and we've taken the information we've gotten from it to see um, you know, what capacity do we think we can get from the well? Um, do we see any problems? We did hit a soil layer that's a little concerning and we're having an expert look at that for us. We've sent them samples, they're testing it, and then we're going to get them involved in trying to see the best way to develop this well. Mr. Chairman. Yes. May I ask you a question on this? So we have to purchase the property before we can get all of the information about how viable the well will be? You have to at least have an agreement, and that agreement is structured so that if you find out the well's not going to work, like the test hole and all that, uh -huh. you have a due diligence period, more or less. Okay. So uh, then you don't have to finish. Yeah, you don't have to buy it. You can do the testing. Okay. Yeah, Good. and in this case, even if the well doesn't work out, we would probably still keep the property and put uh, some storage tanks on it because we're going to have to have more water for Beulah, and we're going to need to bring it if this... If if this well doesn't work out, we've got to bring it from further east. Thank you. Uh, this is the proposed Beulah transmission main, and right now we're looking at going from the intersection, I think it's uh, 97 and 297, coming over to Divine Farms Road and then running to the west under the interstate to Frank Reeder Road all the way to Beulah Road. And we're looking at constructing that project, whether or not we have the well or not. Uh, like I said, we've got to get some water uh, in the future uh, moved into the Beulah area. Uh, tank inspections and rehab. Uh, our goal was to get the Pensacola Christian College tank rehab. We did that. It's back in service. Uh, and then this year we have five-year inspections which are very thorough inspections on several tanks six and we'll find out you know is there major work to be done on them or their uh, minor work uh, and then plan those budget those accordingly uh, Westwell water treatment facility um, this is a pretty good sized project in that it's got a three million gallon ground storage tank, it's got a new well, it's got water treatment facility, it's got a pump station, and then also the carbon treatment. Um, that 500,000 gallon tank that was there is no longer there. Uh, in two or three days, they've pretty much taken it out, taken it down. And I've got a picture of the first day a little later. So the next thing to do is we will uh, have the, the well contractor on site to drill a new well. And then we will um, be building a new three million gallon ground storage tank. That bid is actually in for approval right now. I think the committee yesterday looked at it. Or not yesterday, but the day before. 
operating budget, you talked about the chemicals. Unfortunately, the cost of chemicals has really jumped. Uh, a couple graphs, if you look over uh, from 2018 to 22, stayed pretty level as far as the increase at 7%. Uh, last year, it increased 30%. Chlorine, in the last two years, it has almost tripled in cost in two years. Now, we've talked to these vendors to find out, hey, is, can we expect for these type of increases to continue? And we've been told nothing this drastic, but still, it's not going to come back down, so... Obviously, that affects the operating budget quite a bit. Orthophosphate, 91%, almost double. And then hydrofluorosilic acid fluoride, uh, 66%. Are all of these chemicals necessary? The only one that's not absolutely necessary is the... <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know that it's the same. We'll leave it at that. Yeah. There's one that's not absolutely necessary. <laughs> uh, electricity is another big item. It's affected everybody. It affects us. Um, you know, we're looking at probably be around two and a half million by the end of 23. 21% um, increase. 21 to 22, 11% uh, increase, uh, and then I think this coming year we're expecting something a little less than that, but, you know, who knows. Carbon uh, has also gone up quite a bit in cost, uh, and also the usage of carbon has gone up because we're putting in new GAC treatment at quite a few wells. So operating. can you help me understand, I mean, I know inflation is a part of it, and I know cost to do business is a part of it, but like 141% increase, mm -hmm. help me understand why so much. I mean, is it, is it, a, is it a locally produced Chemicals are the part of the supply chain issues that we're having. I mean, yeah, we've, you know, we've asked the same questions. Um, it's nationally produced. It's not something local. Not that you can't get it from a local vendor, but it's a nationally produced item, as most of these chemicals are. It's just. You know, that's uh, the increase that has been seen based on current market conditions. Um, there has been some talk, or there was some <coughs> talk, that there were some shortages. Um, we're not really being told that anymore. Uh, there was some disruption with the orthophosphate, but the price has not come down, and that disruption has gone past. So... Um, this is just the, the market as it is today. I wish I could give you a better answer, but that's pretty much where it is. I'm, I'm going to jump in with a question or comment while the chairman has been disposed. Uh, I think it's a pretty obvious question. I mean, it, the answer is pretty obvious. All of these, all of these uh, uh, chemicals, and all these other things that are, all are being increasing in cost are either produced, pr provided to us by a monopoly, such as the pow Florida Power and Light, or, or competitively bid, right? Um, power, obviously, is Florida Power and Light. That really don't have another choice. That's a monopoly, if you want to call it that. Most of the other chemicals are competitively bid. Yeah. Um, and even with these increases, these are low bids. Some of the other bids came in 50% higher than the low bid. So t typically, even w where we see these huge increases, they have been competitively bid, and we have gotten competitive bids. 
I mean, yes, sir. it's not single source typically. Yes, sir. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So, <clears throat> I don't know, this, what I wanted the uh, board members with a little more experience to uh, be thinking about and perhaps at some point later weigh in on is have we been here before? And in previous times, what did we what did we do? Because obviously, we're seeing quite a bit of increases in everything in terms of uh, particularly chemicals, but across the board. Uh, you know, we need more personnel. Talking about the issues of money and. Uh, just, just some, some, some lessons learned or some experience of how we were able to uh, manage and move forward. And did you have something you want to say? Well, this <coughs> the answer is yes and no. Yes you know, and no. No, we haven't been here with dramatic increases like this in chemicals before. And the labor market's a little more difficult than it has been, but. We've been here in other areas, you know, for quite insurance. For a while, insurance was killing us every year, going up astronomically. And the chemicals, while the percentages are real high, the overall budget, they're a fairly small percentage of the budget. More concerning would be labor and some of the other, you know, personnel cost. But, you know, what we're, what we're lucky about is that we're in an economically thriving area, but yeah, the costs are high, but the, that's the bad part. The good side is the revenues are high. Mm -hmm. You know, we had, I think I saw a figure the other day, 1,700 new water service hookups. That's 1,700 people paying an average of about $60 a month more income that we're bringing in. And some of those are on sewer, so some of those are new sewer hookups, probably most of them. You know, and so then that's another $80 there. You know, I mean, so... So while it looks, you know, really, really bleak, it's, it's not as bleak as it looks. It's, yeah, it's challenging still. But our staff's always, what we've typically relied upon is, is staff to give, us, to give us a reasonable, rational figure, you know, on what we need, and then we fight over it between ourselves after that. So we've always managed to somehow keep the organization afloat. And I'm sure we will continue to do that. And sort of uh, to fill in a little bit more, during the years between 2006, 2012, when, when the country was in a terrible recession, we just did marvelous things. We took advantage of that when labor was cheap, when materials were cheap. That's when we built the brand new sewage treatment plant. So we really capitalized on the economic times and we're looking right now at an economic phenomenon and, and you know nobody's quite sure what the feds are going to do and, and what the impact we will we'll see what they're doing but what the impact on inflation will be but 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 we're in a pretty good spot I mean not, none of this is doom and gloom we just have to kind of tighten our belts in some ways and also be aware that we've got to raise some salaries and other things, but none of it is devastating. And I think that's, I, I think this process is a cautionary process. Yeah. And, and then we do with it what we need to, but I don't think any of these department heads are coming to us saying the, the world's on fire. No, There's, no, no. You know, so that's, and, and I think we've been a well-run organization for a long time and continue to be. And and that's that's the good news. Okay, yeah. good news. Yeah, it's it's fluid. Things change, and they will they will change, and things will get better and worse. But you know, for the past couple of years, we've been paying around five dollars a gallon for fuel. That's down around three. So I mean, things get <coughs> better, things flows. get worse. Okay, very well. Thank you. I was waiting for Doctor Walker to weigh in. Please do, sir. Uh, my my response to your question. Uh, uh, about have we been here before is we've never seen price increases, cost increases like some of these specific ones. In my opinion, going back to the 1980s, no, 
I don't think they've ever been increased. It's like some of these that we're looking at where you'll see a 141% increase for carbon in one year. Uh, no, uh, uh, I, I think there is, as my general impression of the entire process this week, is that there is a, a, an unusually strong pressure on, on our budget to increase the budget in a number of areas. Fortunately, as Mrs. Benson says, perhaps, perhaps, and Mr. Perkins if, has said, perhaps the revenue is going to be coming in a lot of it without major rate increases. Uh, but they probably have to going to be some rate increases too. The one thing I would like to say that I know you cannot solve a budget problem indefinitely by deciding not to do particular projects this year because the cost is going up. Because next year they're only going to cost more, and if you put them off next year, they're just going to cost more. The next year, so sooner or later, you're going to have to pay whatever the hyper's price is uh, to get a project done. And the notion of well, we're we're going to we're going to cancel this this bid request and not do this right now. You know, I understand that certainly I've done it, a lot of it with ECA, but. Uh, it's not something that solves the problem in long term. Okay, thank you for that discussion. And that's a good point, Dr. Walker, that you made. And when we had all these increases in this past year, there were projects that we would like to do but didn't have to be done. You can't do without the chemicals and also we um, postponed some work uh, and we uh, rejected some bids, and we'll revisit those and move forward. This is mainly just to show we have about a million and a half dollar increase in our operating budget. This is just to show where some of that, the majority of that, is coming from. I'll go back to, oops, not that one, that right there. And our operating budget, as I mentioned, is going to go up about 1.5 million, 15%. Um, 39% of, of that increase is electrical. 37% uh, is due to the increase in chemical costs. And then 21% is due to the increase in personnel costs like raises and merit and progression and that sort of thing. And then the 3% is for increasing costs of other items. Uh, okay. <coughs> Thank you. We have questions on the dais. Uh, Dr. Walker. A comment. When I looked at page 27, that page, when the first number that leaped out at me was 20% increase in personnel cost. Mm -hmm. No, that's not what it says. It says 21% of the total increase is due to personnel cost, but you're not increasing personnel cost by 21%. And I, and I, at first, I thought that's what it said. And uh, just in case anybody else it's, had yeah, the same, made the same mistake, like I wanted to clarify. Of the 15%. Yeah. That was a good point to make for the record. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ms. Ritz? Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Your presentation was well structured and very understandable. Every now and then there was a term, but I'll ask about that later. Um, I'm always a believer in talking to boards of directors, and I wondered if that would ever be possible or is it impractical to approach the board of directors of these various chemical entities? That's just, that's how my thinking is. That's how my thinking goes. Uh, well, we actually talk to them quite a bit. Good. Um, a lot of times that doesn't affect the increase. But uh, a, a good, for instance, is uh, we were buying carbon vessels for around, uh, let me see, for a set of four, we were paying about 560000 That was the low bid. We worked out a deal with one of the vendors where he sold us those 16 new vessels for 
three hundred and ninety something thousand each for the set of four. For each set of four, so we can talk to them. You know, we can try to figure out is there a way that you know we can get the cost down. Um, a lot of times, they are paying more for labor. They're paying more for electricity, like we are. They're paying more for the products that they have to buy to put together their product, and that's the market at this time. But we we do talk to them. We tell them we don't like that kind of price increase. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Ritz? Okay. Okay. We have questions from Ms. Cromati. And this would be to piggyback off uh, Ms. Ritz. So it seems like your suppliers would have some type of justification. And do we just take their word that they're saying that their cost is going up? Do they provide you all with some type of, um, you know, they, they need to show you all something in black and white as to, you know, why these rates and the cost are going up, and then they're putting them, you know, they give them to you all. So it seems like they should have some type of justification as to why these rates are just going up, and we should just not take them for their word. We need to have something. Uh, yeah, if it's a single source, you know, that's done. This is competitively bid, though. And when it's competitively bid, remember, we're awarding to the lowest bid we get. So, um, you know, we can tell them all we want that we want justification, but they're going to submit their bid uh, based on what they think the market is, what their costs are, et cetera. <coughs> okay. We understand. Uh, do you have anything else with yes, sir, your presentation? It. Okay. As Ms. Ritz said, very thorough and logically arranged with a good explanation for the increases. And um, we appreciate that. And we also appreciate continuing to have good water. So uh, we will make that a priority as we have in the past to continue to have good water. So thank you. Thank you all. Okay. <clears throat> We have done water reclamation, engineering, water production, and now we are ready to hear from our sanitation department. And I don't see him. Okay, okay, okay. The other gentleman couldn't make it. Um, if you're talking about our um, uh, Mr. Gary Dean, yes. who's the uh, manager of sanitation, oh, man. um, sanitation budget, as we'll discuss in a little bit, actually covers about seven different divisions, many of which are under Gary's direction, some of which aren't under Gary's direction. Okay. Uh, this normally would be a presentation made by the uh, deputy executive director of force. Shared services. Okay, very well. We're listening. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, sanitation division has uh, actually eight, I think I said seven, has um, uh, eight divisions altogether in terms of its uh, budget. Uh, you'll see there uh, all of them individually listed as well as the complements of staff. So there's 168 altogether that provide these services. I will we'll point out two things. Uh, when you think of sanitation, you primarily think of the uh, trash, bulk waste, recycling, pickup that's done in the field. Uh, that component or subset of this larger group is about 96 of the staff. That's the residential services, yard trash, and recycling uh, line items there. Uh, composting uh, is run separately. Uh, materials recovery facility, the MRF. Uh, as a separate division as well. And we have a separate manager for uh, uh, the garage or, or fleet maintenance uh, also. But altogether, the, for budgeting purposes, 168 uh, staff in those divisions. 
collectively, the operating budget for the sanitation uh, division actually adds up to nearly um, 20, almost $30 million uh, altogether this year. It's a uh, lar one of the uh, larger components of the overall uh, ECUA budget. Um, broken down by individual uh, divisions, you'll see that the you know, increases uh, vary quite a bit from department to department, depending on what cost drivers there are. And I'll be touching on some of those with further slides. A couple I'd like to point out, though, um, uh, garage you'll see is uh, up quite a bit, uh, a little over four hundred twelve thousand dollars. About three hundred and five, three hundred and ten thousand of that is really just the cost of maintaining an older fleet. Now, in FY twenty three, we made a major purchase of uh, twenty three additional uh, replacement vehicles, but they don't show up for a couple of years till spring of twenty four. Uh, this last year, uh, or this year coming up, we're going to purchase um, uh, another ten. Yeah, they won't be available until 25, you know, so right now we're, we're maintaining an older fleet. And that's driving things quite a well, uh, quite a bit. Total operating expenses, though, you'll see when you add, add it all up is uh, surprisingly on the, on the low side. It's uh, right there in that 4% uh, range still, uh, point, point and a half maybe below uh, where we are for the CPI. So that, that portion is good uh, news uh, to share. Uh, there is one uh, additional require, uh, request that we'll probably be adding to that. Uh, now that we've done these calculations, we'll probably be adding a request for a few additional recycling drivers, and I'll touch on that in a few more slides here. Uh, targeted uh, accomplishments uh, overall, and I've got individual slides for, for these topics, but I'll touch on them uh, briefly. Uh, Doing field work, particularly driving vehicles of that size, uh, we're really concerned about safety, safety of the general public, safety of our drivers, et cetera. So uh, we uh, take that very seriously. And our goal is to continue to reduce the number of preventable accidents and, and injuries by 3% on an annual basis. To give you uh, uh, an idea from May of 21 to May of 22, there were 63 accidents of various sorts. Uh, those aren't just roadway accidents between vehicles. Those also include incidences, say, where a uh, driver um, knocked over a mailbox or had some other in you know, things like that as well. 34 of those we, do, we defined as being preventable, things that, that could have happened. Uh, those about between 34 and, and the total 63 were uh, where we were involved in an accident, but it was the other person's fault. So. But from May of 22 to May of uh, 23, that uh, that number dropped to 39 accidents total, and only uh, 18 of those fell into the preventable category. So we had a really good la year last year. Um, reducing the number of missed pickup uh, complaints by 2% on an annual basis is uh, another goal. I've got slides with some of the statistics on that. Removing or uh, processing over 20,000 tons of yard trash annually. Um, is our targeted goal for the compost program. Um, we want to uh, also this next year step up enforcement of the uh, proper use of the ECUA recycling can cans, to, in other words, to get at the contamination issue and to uh, provide warnings and actual removal of those cans when they are uh, used inappropriately. We uh, have already talked with you briefly about the desire to change the bulk waste program to a call-in or work ticket type of program as opposed to the drive every route of every single street uh, type of process. Uh, we very much appreciate your earlier verbal um, encouragement to go ahead and proceed with that. You may have already seen social media advertisements and other types of advertisements to promote the fact that we'll make that transition starting July 1st. Um, I'll talk to you in a little bit uh, also about our, uh, my recommendation to repeal the reduced rates uh, that we currently provide for the purchase of compost. I've got a pretty detailed uh, slide on that subject uh, a little bit later. And then uh, we'd also like to increase the number of commercial trash customers uh, through uh, competitive marketing. And we received some earlier support uh, when we discussed that topic with the board. Mr. Chairman, may I ask a couple of questions? Yes, Mr. Um, 
I want to talk about sort of objectives and targeted accomplishments for just a minute. I, what I'm reading about, and if, if our mission is to be green and to reduce pollutants and all of that, what I'm reading is methane gas is probably one of the worst environmental hazards that we're confronting right now, and it's easily dealt with with composting. But that composting really has to be done at the household level. Have you seen any programs where a utility has a mechanism to work with households and collect the, the food waste um, in a systematic way to address this issue? I've, uh, I've not seen one at the residential level. I was actually involved in one that used uh, institutional uh, opportunities to grab food waste for, uh -huh. for production and, and uh, um, my previous uh, experience in Missouri, we picked up food waste from a, uh, a jail, a pretty large uh, state facility that was about 30 minutes east of us, and we picked up uh, food waste from their uh, operations, from their cafeteria operations. And then we also picked it up from the school district. Uh, those are larger volumes. Sure. Um, the practicality of picking individual food waste from residences yeah. is hard. I, I would like for us to, to look, you know, our composting program has been so successful and, and we're recovering waste, we're keeping it from going in the landfill and we're actually producing a, a usable product. I would like to pursue the idea of maybe the hospitals, the schools and some of the others. Let's, let's look at what, and since you have experience, let's, let's look at how that might work and how it might impact us. Uh, particularly in re reducing methane gases uh, in the landfill. Um, that, that's number one on my list if, um, I mean, obviously that's not going to be next year's, but mm -hmm. if we can sort of look ahead, I think that would be an innovation. Uh, the other thing is, that, well, let me ask you about contaminants, and it's kind of hard to separate the MRF operations from this, but, you know, they both impact each other. So we're at about a 50% contamination rate now. Overall, yes. So how does that work? So if I have a pristine recycling can and my neighbors have contaminated cans and they all go into one truck, if their contaminants are in there, is the whole truckload gone? Uh, no. And when I tell you the overall contamination rate is 50%, um, stop and think about how, <coughs> how much over 50% contamination some uh, folks, um, some folks' recycling can is in order to dilute the ones like Miss Ritz that are pristine mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and uh, doing a wonderful job. Um, that 50% is a net uh, after we've mixed everything. Uh, as far as rejection, uh, when it arrives on the uh, tipping floor at the MRF, our staff have the authority to reject a load, and all of our contracts with our outside partners uh, allow us to do that. If the contamination is visibly, if it's all, all trash, and like they've sent us the wrong load, or there's a, a really obvious problem, we can't reject that load. They're not paid for it. Uh, they also have to pay the tipping fee for us to get rid of it. Plus, there's an additional, rather modest uh, penalty fee that goes on top of that. That doesn't happen all that often because it all comes in about 50%. It's kind of hard to tell sometimes. But it, it does on occasion. Okay. So, you know, I, based on this contamination rate, I think our recycling program is a failure. We have all... I was so for recycling, and I, every time our numbers went up, I got more excited about people in this community being committed to recycling. But, but in this case, quantity isn't quality. And I think we've got to totally rethink what our goals are in this recycling. And, and truthfully, education is not the answer to this. And I'm an educator by training. But... If, if education were the answer, nobody would be using plastic bags at the grocery store because we all know that those things don't decompose. You would have to live under a rock to believe that 
these plastic bags are a good thing. But when I go to the grocery store, I'm the only one with, with a bag on. So education isn't it. The only, the only way to change that behavior is economically. If we charged a dollar for every plastic bag at the grocery store, not we, but the publics or whatever, it would, people would start recycling. Um, and, and so I think we've got to look at something where there are incentives or disincentives um, regarding recycling and, and, and maybe reduce significantly our customers who are in the recycling program, um, which will change some numbers of drivers and all of those kinds of things. But even to look further, so it used to be that most of our recycling materials, what we captured, went to China. And they did a lot of the sorting there. And that's no longer happening. So, and, and originally, some recycling programs were not curbside, but it was done at a central facility that the customer didn't do the recycling at all. Um, and, and maybe is this, you know, I, I'm asking questions because it's just not working. And, and I think we need to take the whole thing apart and say, what are our options and, and where can we improve it so that we're truly recycling? Uh, you know, and I'm sorry I'm rambling, but you know, I, I, plastics are essentially not recyclable and we keep trying to have different number of plastics and all that. I think we say to people, don't put plastics in there. You could put glass, you can put paper, you could put cardboard. No glass. Well, but it is recyclable. You know, at some point it we'll, is, fi we'll it, find it, markets for it. We have to pay to get rid of it. Right. right now. You know, it, it comes to what our mission is, but heck, we're subsidizing anyways. So. Right. <laughs> but, but, you know, we're deluding ourselves with these plastics pretending that they're recyclable when most of them are not. Um, but I, I just think we, we need to take it all apart and say, what is our mission? What impact are we having, and at what cost? And and anyway, I, I, I'm asking more questions. I don't have answers, but I do know that what we're doing isn't working. And and by the way, I'm not pointing finger, fingers at you. I'm pointing. It's all of us. We our hearts are in the right place, but we're we got to do it differently. So sorry, off the bandstand. No, uh, your, your questions are, are a great setup for our Monday's discussion because uh, the, pre the preparation materials I'm preparing for Monday's discussion are to kind of pick apart all of the cost centers associated with uh, recycling. Some of them are directly in the MRF operation, um, but you'd be surprised some of them are outside of the MRF operation and don't really get thought of or counted when you figure just how much is the cost to provide the service and how it's impacting other areas of our operation. Yeah, I don't know if you'll remember, but th three years ago when I was at this podium being interviewed for this position, <laughs> several of you asked me questions about my feelings about recycling. <clears throat> my answers at that time were environmentally, it's the right thing to do. And uh, to the extent that you can support the cost and your uh, customers are supportive of that, it's the right thing to do. Um, but it is expensive to do. And uh, it comes at a cost. Uh, the, if there was money to be made in it, the private sector would be out there doing it. The only people doing recycling out there are public sector folks. So uh, it's a challenge. And in the current market, it's uh, more so. Well. It, it so just one other thing, and I promise I'll get off the soapbox. You know, in a way, we're deluding people into thinking they're, like, if, if you go buy a 24-pack of bottled water because somebody tells you these bottles are recyclable, really, they have a huge in environmental impact. You know, I want people like Mr. Sears, who comes up with a metal bo bottle that he has refilled, um, because... When people think they're doing the right thing, getting these bottles and recycling them, they're not. There's a huge environmental cost. And so let's make sure that what we accept is truly environmentally viable rather than and, – and let's take less, which would mean fewer trucks, fewer drivers maybe, and, um, but, but have 
a robust but small program would be my direction. Yeah. And I know we'll talk about it Monday, but I'm planting seeds. Okay. <laughs> Um, let's see. The um, residential recycling and bulk waste services. Uh, right now, we have about eighty-six thousand customers altogether, and it may be of uh, interest to you that um, it's only about sixty-seven thousand of those actually have recycling services. Uh, have asked for a, a can. Uh, when they started with us or, or subsequently have come back. So about 78% of our residential customers have a recycling can. Um, overall, that 86,000 uh, count number has increased about 1.75% over this last year. It's about 1,500 customers that we added in FY22. Uh, additional sanitation routes have been added in 2020 to address that growth. Uh, right now, uh, a typical 27 cubic yard side loader vehicle uh, ideally will only be picking up um, 1,000 to 1,100 maybe cans or so. If you really push it though, and we were at the time, we were putting as much as 1,500 cans picked up on a route uh, for each one of those uh, facilities. Sometimes they made it, sometimes they had to, to, to dump several times to, to get to that point. So we added additional routes to help deal with uh, the uh, trash route problem and the growth primarily in the Beulah area. What we haven't uh, done that time, however, is add additional recycling routes. Now we're talking about pros and cons of recycling, et cetera, but we still have a, a growth problem in recycling. So uh, we're proposing to add uh, four additional drivers for uh, adding additional recycling routes to complement the trash routes that we had added back in 2020. Now, we're not asking for new uh, equipment. We believe we have the equipment to cover it, but we don't have the drivers to, to address it. Uh, we've already mentioned the changing the uh, bulk waste um, program from a route service where we pick it up at the curb instead to uh, have it be a call in rather than do it through routes. And we also uh, continue to emphasize safety through having uh, safety incentives for our staff. Uh, I mentioned those um, accidents. Uh, if a driver is involved in an accident that is um, his or her's fault, then that particular quarter uh, they miss an opportunity to re to receive you know, one fourth of their safety incentive for the for the whole year. That safety incentive being about thirty four hundred dollars. So there's a uh, financial incentives on top of just, you know, not wanting, obviously, to, to, to be involved in an accident. Uh, this, this graph only has one set of bars, but I'm going to discuss uh, some additional information uh, as well. On the, uh, down to customer service, they track calls that they receive uh, yeah, directly from callers or ones that get routed through uh, yourselves or, or from other staff. Whenever there's a uh, missed pickup or sanitation complaint, let me define the two of those. A uh, missed pickup would be that first call when somebody says, hey, you missed my uh, trash or recycling, whatever the case may be. Uh, if it's a complaint, uh, that's, that's where somebody's had to call in a second time, say, hey, they still haven't picked it up and, and we have a record that it's, it's been called in before. Uh, let's look at those uh, second complaints, uh, which is what's on the, what's on the screen there. Uh, ten thousand uh, calls. If uh, that's you know ten thousand per that's a yearly number. Ten thousand per year. So that's one hundred ninety two per week. If you divide that uh, out by how many customers we have, that's a point two percent. Still a number we certainly want to continue to go down. But I think it's worthy of uh, keeping that uh, in perspective, given that each customer gets service four times a week because we pick up trash, we pick up recycling, we pick up bulk waste, we pick up yard waste. So uh, keeping those uh, complaints down at that low I think is somewhat admirable. We're still going to continue to uh, to work on reducing those numbers. Uh, by overall comparison, it's important for me to tell you what the, uh, the overall missed pickup call rate is. In, in 2020, it was 22,143. In 2021, a fairly stable, 22,507. Uh, I think we did some major um, 
improvements in this last year with the hiring of uh, Gary Dean and his staff. I think that they're performing uh, much better than they have in quite some time. And that that uh, missed pickup call rate went down to 19,978. So there was about a 17%, excuse me, 11% drop uh, over the last year in those first calls. That f those first calls, not the repeat calls, but the first calls went down by 11% last year. Last year. And, and some of you had mentioned that you're getting a few or less calls, so that's hopefully corroborates that. Mr. Dr. Walker, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, you said the number of complaints was two per, equal to 2% of the number of customers? Point or, two. or point two. Point two. So two tenths. So point, point oh, oh, two. Yeah. yeah. Uh, point yeah, two tenths of one percent. Yeah, so it's not so. You know, it makes it makes it's just, neither figure is very high, but it's it makes a difference. So yeah. it's nice to know it's the point two. Point two. Yeah. <coughs> okay, thank you. Please continue. Uh, while we're in the general uh, discussion of uh, uh, trash collection, it's worth noting that we continue to work on a project for a transfer station. Uh, that's an aerial view in this particular photo, and what's uh, overlaid on top of it is the footprint of what we propose our uh, transfer station to look like. Uh, it's still going through some tweaks, so it'll, it'll be uh, not exactly like that. My main point of illustrating that is that we've uh, taken a fresh look at what we had earlier proposed. I think the original proposal was a building that was uh, twice as wide and three times longer than what that current uh, footprint is. So rather than having a facility that would have a open tipping floor and transfer into open top containers, we've uh, done our research and found out that there's some good opportunities and good systems available for us to be able to do a direct vehicle-to-vehicle uh, -vehicle transfer without exposing it to the open air. Uh, it's a faster operation, uh, less manpower, less equipment, less opportunities for odor issues, et cetera. So uh, I'm really pleased with the direction that we're going. We did lose a little bit of time in that, uh, that review, but we, we think in the long run for this capital investment, it'll be well worth it. Um, as far as how that uh, building looks, uh, it may be kind of hard to see, but the, the top view uh, on the right, there's there's two illustrations. The one on the right would be the uh, how the trucks would uh, approach and pull in and back into essentially a hopper uh, that would drop down a chute into what is then in the second uh, illustration. Uh, the first floor illustration is where the compactors are. Compactor then uh, pushes, compacts that material and pushes it out into the back end of a trailer. And um, so one is above the other. You're not having to do all the transfer. You're letting gravity uh, do the work for you. You're not having to do all the handling as well. The uh, garage or fleet maintenance is our uh, other division. You know, repair and maintenance costs are in increasing uh, almost 305,000. We're proposing in the budget for next year due to the aging fleet. Majority, about 47 of our complement of vehicles were uh, purchased in 2012. Uh, we have another component that was purchased in 2015 when we started the Santa Rosa service. So they're really getting some uh, some age on them. Although we've made purchase uh, major purchase last year and another one in 24, uh, the timeline for getting vehicles is pushing 18 months now. So that's uh, that's a, a challenge in getting from here to there when we actually receive them. ECY received uh, or spent uh, 9.9 million in FY23 to purchase 23 sanitation vehicles. Those vehicles average cost now are about $486,000. Last time we bought vehicles in 2012, a large bunch of them, they were in the $250,000, $260,000 range. Um, Debt service, or the, the way we're funding those, the 2012 uh, debt service for that purchase is uh, just got paid off uh, last year. So we have about 1.1 million worth of debt service from that prior bank loan that we'll be using going forward to apply to the for the purchase here. Big deal, big difference, however, of course, is last time we, for about the same amount of money, we bought 47 vehicles, now we're only buying 23. 
Uh, the FY24 budget proposes an additional $5 million for the purchase of five san sanitation vehicles. They won't arrive till the spring of 25. Uh, again, a fairly similar deal. We've got some uh, debt service from the 2015 purchase that will be in law this past, is it April, March? March, and that'll, that'll free up about 750000 Oh, is Justin out there? I didn't even see him. <laughs> hey, Mr. Woody, take a pause. Yeah, it's hard to find him there with all that sea of green. Uh, take a pause. I have a question, uh, yeah. Mr. Yes. Brown? Yes. He answered it already. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, we, um, that's just a discussion on the 116 or so vehicles that are maintained uh, for the sanitation fleet. Uh, the, the fleet maintenance also maintains a tremendous amount of what we generically call rolling stock. That's everything from loaders and uh, other tired equipment and tracked equipment as well, uh, as well as the passenger vehicles and trucks that are driven by uh, staff as part of their service. Historically, we've budgeted about $2 million a year for uh, annual replacements on the uh, white fleet. Uh, this next year, we bumped that to 2.5 million. Really aren't buying more than we have annually. It's just that the cost of vehicles has really gone to the roof. Uh, I've also allowed a few changes uh, this next year. Uh, we remain very committed to our CNG program for the large sanitation fleet. Uh, however, for some of the white fleet, the smaller passenger vehicles, uh, the, co the upfront cost for buying the CNG package, plus the reduced salvage value at the end, plus now the calculated cost of uh, difference, uh, cost of um, uh, fuel over the lifetime, life cycle of the entire vehicle, it's costing us more to operate that size of, of vehicle. So for the first time in, in quite a while, I have authorized uh, some diesel purchases in the white fleet that historically have been CNG. Now those are the smaller vehicles. Um, we still will remain committed with the, with the uh, sanitation vehicles. Uh, fleet okay. maintenance is another challenge, uh, as, as we've Mr. mentioned Woody, before, there's been... Can you pause? We have a question. Sure. sure I didn't see. Mr. Cromani. Yes, do we uh, purchase the uh, fleet from the same company? Um, vehicles are a commodity that are purchased by so many public entities that there are lots of opportunities for cooperative purchasing agreements. Uh, there are uh, some large cities like Houston or uh, large uh, organizations across the United States that put together annual bid, sometimes even s several times a year, on common vehicles. And they're publicly advertised, publicly bid, and more often than not, we find the most competitive purchase prices for um, rolling stock to be made off of those cooperative purchasing agreements, rather than having to, to bid them ourselves. So um, not always, but probably the majority of the time, we use cooperative purchasing agreements. Thank you. Uh, that's just simple economies of scale. Because they're so, selling so many. Um, fleet maintenance has had qu uh, quite a challenge uh, with uh, mechanics. Uh, all year, on average, they've probably had uh, five vacancies pretty consistently. It'll ebb and flow. Uh, this, this last week, we lost three. Um, you know, we get them hired, they'll be here you know, a few months and, and a couple of them will disappear, one of them will stay. It's, uh, it remains a challenge. And that was three mechanics? Mechanics. We lost in last week or this week? Uh, just this last week, yeah. One, uh, one was a drug screen pro pro problem, but the other two decided they uh, just didn't want to work in a sanitation environment. They were probably looking more for a, a car dealership or something like that. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, how many positions are, do we have uh, on the garage, the mechanics? I believe it's, I believe it's 39 total. 39? 
Um, right. I can't give you the subset of how many of those are specifically. I don't know that number off the top of my head. Probably about 70% of those are actually mechanics, that maybe even 80%. There's other support personnel as well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, are these diesel mechanics that we're talking about or, or uh, big truck mechanics? Uh? Uh, yes, yes. Um, you know, we have a few labor positions that uh, really just uh, change tires and things like that, that, and that's probably the single most frequent operation we do that, than anything else. But yes, we have diesel mechanics. We also have specially trained CNG mechanics. Um, much like uh, the other departments that you've heard discussed, we'll, uh, these staff have to have certifications as well, SAE certifications, depending on what type of, you know, of component, what level of mechanical training that, that they've had and that they maintain as well. Mr. Chairman, I, okay. I will say that I don't know how we even keep diesel mechanics. I mean, they're so competitive right now, the hourly rates for, you know, a, for a boat to get a diesel mechanic out there and work on the boat is just through the roof. I don't know what we pay per hour, but I'm, I'm sure it's nothing like you know what other people are paying it's just gone insane so i can see why it's so difficult to uh to keep them okay uh i've already mentioned a couple of these statistics but i'll, I'll t touch on them uh, again we have 118 sanitation collection vehicles those are the ones that actually collect uh, um, trash yard trash etc 69 of those are the side loaders the the large 27 uh, cubic yard 29 of them are rear loaders or, or boom trucks, usually used for the bulk waste program or the yard waste program. 20 um, commercial uh, vehicles, those are uh, front forked for picking up uh, two to eight cubic yard uh, dumpsters for the commercial division. They also have uh, roll-off trucks for large 20, 30, and 40 cubic yard uh, roll-off containers. Um, on a nine-year replacement schedule, Ideally, we should be buying about 13 trucks uh, a year. So you know, this, you know, we've got by last year and this year because we had convenient uh, debt service coming off. But if we're going to support uh, a million dollars worth of uh, debt service every other year to start replacing fleet at an appropriate schedule, that alone is, uh, is going to cost about 3% worth of uh, rate increase. Uh, annually on top of any other, other cost that's going up. So that's that's a challenge that we'll have, not this year, but the following year and going forward. Uh, right now, even with the uh, upcoming replacements, we have 20 side loaders that are going to need replacing in the next two years, eight rear loaders, uh, and eight um, knuckle boom trucks that are reaching, reaching the end of their recommended useful life, based on mileage as well as hours. In our uh, commercial service division, uh, the ECUA has uh, exclusive rights for commercial service on Pensacola Beach, but we compete in the open market elsewhere throughout the uh, mainland. Uh, we've had some discussions with you recently, and you gave some support for um, trying to compete in that open market. Historically, we've just uh, had a set schedule that has increased commercial rates at the same across the board you know, three or four percent as whatever we've done on the residential side. Um, the open market for uh, commercial service has really run away from us, and uh, there's some missed opportunities there. Uh, I think that there's some opportunities to bring in some additional income and help offset some of these rising costs on the residential side if we compete in the open market. I appreciate your support to, to do so. Over... Um, I think I've already covered those points. So that's, uh, that's it for that slide. Uh, a couple other points about uh, commercial services, though. Uh, just as kind of a trial effort, I challenged our staff to uh, get out and with the available equipment that we already had to start making some cold calls uh, in areas where we were already providing service. Stop at the business next door and say, hey, here's our rates. Would you be interested, et cetera? Um, they added 25 new commercial accounts in the last three months, just doing a little bit of that. Uh, I think with some advertising that we will, should ha have a good opportunity to, to be competitive, especially in the uh, roll-off dumpster service. 
uh, right now, our rates, uh, we have one rate to set that roll off dumpster, and then it sits there until they call us and we pick it up. All of our competitors, uh, standard is whether you use it or not, you're going to pay a fee per month. <laughs> we haven't been collecting a monthly fee. We have some folks that have had things for three and four and ten months. You know, they're essentially keeping our our uh, equipment out of the market. So yeah, one family uh, was using one as a swimming pool. We just kept it out there, filled it with water. And there you go. No. <laughs> Put a liner in it. <laughs> Um, also, uh, with the upcoming uh, transfer station project, uh, I challenged our staff to clean up our backyard. Uh, our north part of our property has had many years worth of accumulation of um, commercial dumpsters and roll-offs, et cetera, that have a busted hinge, a sprung latch, whatever the case may be, rusted out in the bottom. Um, a fire in it, and rather than them being hauled off or fixed or repaired and put back in service, they've been accumulating. So uh, in order to do two things, number one, get things back into service uh, to where they're being productive for us and getting revenue, we took about two-thirds of the budget that we had for buying new equipment and uh, invested that in repairing our old stuff, pulling it back out of the woods, making a decision whether it goes to the scrapyard or whether it gets repaired, including a repaint and back into service. Uh, this next year, we'll be buying uh, new equipment, but uh, our first initiative was to clean up our backyard and get other stuff back out, out and going. Uh, next year, though, we'll probably be buying about $30,000 worth of uh, new dumpsters and replacing several, uh, three uh, compactors, which are pretty expensive. Uh, some of our uh, customers, such as uh, Portofino, have uh, trash compactors in their lower levels of the garage. And uh, some of those need replacement. Uh, this is my last slide, but we're going to spend a little bit of time on this, so hopefully not, not too terribly long. Uh, this is a composting operation. Um, first look at the graph on the left. Uh, it shows the uh, volumes of compost that we uh, produced over the last four years. You'll see there's three different colors there. One is the, in blue. That's the compost that we sell. Uh, some of you may have met uh, Anthony, uh, does a wonderful job for us, very personable. Um, it's, uh, so for residents who want to pick up, you know, just a pickup truck's worth or a couple bags, they, they visit Anthony and that's, that's where that is, that is sold. Uh, those are the blue numbers. Uh, those numbers are in tons, so we sell, you know, for, you know, around five, six thousand tons uh, per year through that operation. Uh, we sell it to residents as well as uh, commercial folks who will pick up, you know, hundreds sometimes of, uh, of tons at a time. Uh, the next uh, one is mulch for landfill cover. That's uh, kind of a yellowish gold color. Uh, that is mulch that we provide to the uh, Perito landfill as a part of our ag lease agreement for the MRF. Um, our lease agreement with the MRF says that in exchange for leasing five acres of ground, which is more than what just the MRF sits on, that actually includes where the, their other yard trash operation goes, <coughs> that uh, we grind mulch for them for yard trash that comes into the Perdido landfill after they receive revenue for it. Um, but we also have a certain volume that we're to provide them from our own operation. Uh, they use it for um, alternative daily cover. At the end of every day, they cover the active fill face with it. Uh, and then at the end of every week, they have to cover that yet again. And uh, it's uh, less expensive than hauling a lot of dirt and it works out very well for them. Uh, the gray bar is about Three to five thousand dollars, three to five thousand tons uh, per uh, per year of uh, finished compost that we send to them. They use it as a soil amendment to help grow grass on the slopes of the landfill. It's very hard to grow grass on a landfill when you've got methane coming up. You mentioned it, it being a, a greenhouse gas, methane 
is 23 times stronger greenhouse gas than CO2 is. It's a, it's, it's a serious concern. So it's, it's difficult for them. So they, it, it helps them uh, grow grass. Um, but usually when we talk about our compost operation, we're thinking about the, uh, the blue bars, or what, what's, what's sold. You can see that's actually not a huge component of, of the overall amount of compost we produce. And when we talk on Monday about uh, the MRF and expenses, we'll talk about the budgeted expenses to run that particular operation. But I'm gonna start adding in some other things that we don't talk about that are actual real costs but they're cost centers outside of that program, so we don't think about the fact that it's, a, it's still a drag on our overall uh, program in terms of cost. Um, now if you go to the, uh, the next box, just to the right of it, um, ECUA code section 15.3 was uh, passed when the compost program started, and uh, this board or prior members establish a sales price for selling the compost. Uh, at that time, it was a brand new program. Uh, we wanted to let it go cheap to promote it and encourage its use. Uh, had a lot of optimism for growing the program, et cetera. Um, and it did that, and it, and it did uh, really grow. Uh, but we have not changed that you know, price since that time. It has remained the same. And if you, uh, if you look at the, I've got two little rectangles. Let's look at the, the one on the, on the left there first. Uh, we've got prices broken down by sale by cubic yard. We also have it broken down if sold by ton. Uh, usually, if you go to the store and you say, well, can I get a volume discount if I buy more? Will you reduce the price a little bit? Usually, well, I'll give you 2% off or I'll give you 5% off. If you get really lucky, maybe they'll cut it by 10% if you buy a whole lot of whatever it is you're buying. Uh, our reduced rates go from $10 to $7 to $4. So we're, we're giving discounts of anywhere from 30 to 60% if they buy by volume. Um, right now, we have, uh, of, of, that, of that total, uh, let's see, that's, those numbers up there are in tons. So, um, last year, where we sold, now I'm looking at the blue bar number there, <clears throat> where we sold 6,354 tons of compost using this price structure, 3,256 of it was sold at either the $7 or $4 discount rate. It was largely purchased by commercial buyers. Some of them that are even outside of this county and outside of this state who come in with tractor trailers, turn around it and repackage it, increase the price by 15 to 20 percent and, and sell it. I admire anybody that can make a profit. I have no, no problem with that. But when I hear that sometimes our own residents have to wait because we're out because we can't give them two yards because we just sold 300 yards <laughs> to an out-of-state that concerns me. So um, my, my recommendation in the little bar next to that is that we consider changing our rate structure. I'm not proposing that we raise the basic rate, which is you know, the, the average residence is buying less than 10 cubic yards. So they're always paying the $10. I recommend that we just keep that that's the price. Whether you buy one or 10 or 400 cubic yards, it's $10. Uh, that is still a bargain. Maybe they can only mark it up 10 times instead of 20 times <laughs> if they want to buy that much. Uh, I think that'll somewhat reduce the amount that's going outside of our county to commercial folks. And we have some commercial folks in town as well. So you, you may get some complaints from a local commercial buyer perhaps. Uh, but if that reduces the amount of volume that's going to the commercial folks, that will leave a little more volume for um, mom and pop who are just doing um, um, you know, a vegetable garden in their backyard, or trying to grow grass, or whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, Mr. Williams, can I 
Yes. yes. So, so do we have to set that rate as a board? Yes. So we can't give some market flexibility because, so what if, you know, we raise this rate and we don't have any buyers, so we need to have the ability to, to lower it some. You know, we, we got to figure out the, the nature of the market. Mm -hmm. um, and sure. that demands a little flexibility. I yeah. guess you could keep coming to us, but that seems cumbersome. Uh, sure. Uh, and, and that's why I'm not recommending that we change the basic $10 rate. All I'm asking is that uh, we stop giving 30 to 60% discounts. But uh, I would hope if volume. suddenly you notice we had this glut of material, mm -hmm. you would come back to say, you know, we're going to have to implement sure. some kind of a discount program. Yeah. Sure. Um, and, and then the then the lowest one uh, down there where I've got prices of 16 based on the ton. My adjustments there were just to make sure that whether you bought it by the cubic card or bought it by the ton, you're paying the same unit price. Um, if you did the math on the old on the old prices, they didn't make sense. Uh, you could buy the same volume, but you tell them you want to buy it by the yard. It was cheaper than if you bought it by the ton, and, and it just didn't make sense. So. Um, so that's my last on the, on the compost, except for maybe to say that um, uh, co compost is a it's a, it's a well run operation. Um, I appreciate uh, the wonderful job that Tim Dean and his staff do. Uh, it hasn't met the goals that we originally had. We we were hoping that uh, I'm told this predates me. Uh, they were hoping to use as much as uh, fifty percent of our. Uh, sludge from the CWRF into the uh, compost program, and therefore would reduce the cost of uh, running that operation. In reality, the volumes we have going through have not been such that we've used more than about 25% as opposed to 50%. So we've unfortunately missed uh, missed that target. Uh, also, it is a fairly capital intensive uh, program in terms of the equipment. You don't have to buy the equipment very often. Um, but uh, we've got a couple pieces that we probably have to replace uh, next year that are uh, quite pricey. Um, we have a rotor chopper out at the MRF that would be about 1.2 million to replace. And uh, we just got finished making repairs to the tub grinder and spent 150,000 or something. Yeah, just every little thing is expensive. Uh, that's the last I have for sanitation. If there's any other questions you might have. Uh, does it appear to be any questions, you know, when you get to the fourth present presenter in the day? <laughs> everybody, wears, <laughs> everybody wears down. <laughs> so, uh, well, I just reminder the uh, the Murph then that we, we, we put off, that will be on Monday. Right. And that will be a, a lengthy conversation where we'll try to pick apart the various component parts of uh, of the MRFs expenses and revenues trends and talk about some cost centers that are outside of the program. And we're, we're already gearing up for that one on Monday, so uh, we look forward to that on Monday with the capital with improvement. Yeah, we we'll do the CIP first. Okay. Uh, so we will continue with our agenda for today, and I'm sure this is just uh, protocol, but I don't, is, is there any, is there, yeah, right, as we, as we talk about unfinished business. <laughs> There's no more unfinished business than new business. Is there any new business? Committee communications? Dr. Walker? Mr. Chairman, yes. the most irritating thing about sitting up here during one of these meetings is this little push button on the to speak, uh, the, to make the green light, the light change from red to green. You know, I push and push and push, and I notice Mrs. Benson has the same problem. I notice Mrs. Cromarty had the same problem. Uh, we need something done about these little push button things. The problem is, is in the South, you don't push, you mash. You got to mash the button. <laughs> Uh, I'm as southern as, more, as you, if not more, but whatever. Okay, that's, uh, that's a good comment for the committee and for staff to hear. Uh, I have a communication, too. Okay, yes, we have more from Ms. Benson. 
We've, we've all missed uh, Ms. Campbell this week during these meetings, and I'm sure all of you know that her mother passed away last weekend. I, I would love for us to send some flowers from the CAC for her services, if we could ask our staff to do that, just on, from all of the members of the CAC. Thank you. Absolutely. Recommend bringing in something. I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Uh, Blair. Bringing in funds on Monday to bring to you, or, or is this something that the committee? I I think it can come out of ECU. Yeah, yeah. These uh, you're all as elected and appointed uh, uh, positions. You're volunteering your time. I think it's a worthy and reasonable expense. Basically. Very well. Good comment. Thank you very much for that. I know we were in thought for her during these proceedings. As you all wondered, why was I here every time you came and not her? And so we are uh, glad to do that. Uh, as we continue with committee communications, are there any more? Any others? I have no pink slips for open forum. I just would like to say for everyone who's attended and sitting on a dais for all of these meetings, thank you. And for those who are in the audience who stayed past the presentation, thank you. We're adjourned. <laughs>